have a we had a name for a political party. Um, it was something about the um, I don't know data. No, it was the I don't know. I don't remember the name. But anyway, the idea was to simply have a very data driven approach to to whatever kind of decision you had to make. So then let people to simply provide their own ideas about you know this is the reason I think we should have this kind of tax rate in whatever. And and you had a really kind of you know data driven approach for it. Mm. But I haven't really seen any kind of party that do that. Exactly. And that's kind of strange. It is strange. And you but the you, you need to like package it in a nice way, right? It mm. has to be in your narrative. It's much more storytelling and vision where you should use that data. So I think yeah, many problems many many reasons uh, sometimes are data driven uh, culture doesn't work is that people just talk about the data as is and then mm. yeah. the people don't follow that. But but uh, y- y- let's just reframe. Y- basically, uh, the starting point here, how can we not have more objective data as part of the political debate? I- if we use co- circle back to that core idea and, and mm. those examples. So what's the starting point here as you see it? Um, I, I don't know exactly why we cannot, right? So just thinking about how it works, um, if I understand it correctly now, the, the political parties, they go and request the data from um, a support organization that they have access to. And this, uh, uh, this um, uh, organization helps them to, pr- to provide data points and analysis for them, for that party, for, for I don't know, ad hoc questions, I, I presume. And then these parties, uh, they use the same agency to provide <laughs> these data points. And then they go to the debates, public debates that we watch on TV. And then they use these, uh, each party use their own versions of that truth, uh, of, the, uh, um, of the responses they got from their requests from the same agency. And then they use that to throw different versions of the truth against it, each other's. Which is unfortunate, right? Because uh, we all it know that the, we all know that that's how you how you uh, just slice and dice the numbers until you get the right, the, the numbers that support your narrative. Yeah. Which is not how you should make and lies. Yeah, right? yeah. it's not yeah. how you yeah. should <laughs> lies. Damn lies, statistics. <laughs> but we <laughs> know we know it yeah. works like this, right? This is also how organizations work. This is the, the natural way of making decisions for yourself. If you just take you you want to find data that supports your own thesis, right? And then you but try to find those numbers and then you love it and then everything else that doesn't support your thesis, and, and you don't want to see. And you hear it here first on AI <laughs> after work. Yeah. This is the call out for the 2022 election. Are we, are we really going to fall for this one more time or can we do something else? So, you, ha- you, you, sh- you know, there are some very simple examples. Do you highlight them? Yeah. What, 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 you know, simple right. stuff that would make a more objective uh, use of data, yeah. if, you, if you elaborate. Yeah, exactly. So when listening to these debates, I mean, if, if someone could just help the viewer to understand the, uh, some of the common ground or the facts before the parties are discussing a topic. Uh, for example, the most simplest, simplistic one is to just show what, what is the budget allocation for each different party because then you, you understand much more of where are the, where are the differences uh, and if one party talks about one initiative you need to understand how it's funded what have they redacted from somewhere else and if you don't understand that then it's impossible to understand what's the consequences of Mon- money talks in some way and, yeah. and just showing that table the overview mm-hmm. so when someone some party is talking about one initiative part of the budget show them uh, like how that differs f- from the others. Mm. Show that allocation split. It's very simple. Just I think very, this very is a brilliant, start. simple idea. And I, I, do, I used to get frustrated when I realized, why, why aren't we looking at those simple budget allocation numbers every election? Because when you get into the single narrative of one question, the political acumen, mm-hmm. the way they, they, they can carry themselves, they, they, they will talk up whatever they are doing mm. to sound huge and beautiful. Yes. But when you put them hardcore next to each, each other, show me the money. Mm. How much money are you actually spending on the school? Yes. How much and money where do you are take you it at? from? And where do you take it from? It's a very simple, basic uh, data yeah. uh, visualization yeah. that would basically give, a, oops, that's really what they're spending my money on. Why exactly. don't we know this? Of course, it's all out in the open because they all put the budget uh, proposition and the and the other guys do the same. Yeah. 
But I think it's just that we're not used to that the data-driven mindset of making a decision to, to like, wait, I don't, uh, I need to, to, un- to really make up my mind here. I need to understand the, the full objective, like, truth here. You, you, you put me down a rabbit hole. <laughs> I'm going to go out <laughs> and look at these visual. I'm going to get these. But, but think about the more complex questions, uh, data about crime, about immigration, about ah. all those kind of things that, peop- that the parties are just throwing at each other. It's impossible for the viewer to understand What's the the right part? And not only for the viewers, I would argue. I think it's super hard for politicians to make an informed decision as well about how to allocate the budget as well. You know, that's why I really, you know, I I wrote about this um, paper that came from actually Salesforce um, and also Stanford and others that try to simulate how to set the proper tax rate in balance to equality. Mm. If you have, you know, too high or too low tax rate, that will have some kind of effect on the on, on the society. And if you argue for too high equality, that will also have some effect on productivity, for mm. example, on on the society. And and then they simply try to simulate that. They have some very simplistic, you know, yeah, ways to model the world. But it's an optimization. But at problem. least they could make some kind of simulation that they see what happens if you increase the tax rate or not. And mm. you can see the effects on equality and productivity from that. And at least then you have like an AI or data-driven approach to try to, I mean, it's not perfect, but at least they're trying to. But it's a mindset, right? You want to understand the complete consequences and then you try to find data. And and you should also be fine that even if you don't have the exact data, just by visualizing what you know and what you don't know, and then I form a thesis on, we believe this, so we do this because we believe that. But but bottom line, isn't this all about data literacy or or data maturity in, in different industries? And if you look at politics, as, a, as an operating yes. business or whatever. I mean, like the way we do politics, and, and then you can go and look at <laughs> the debates in England, you know, <laughs> they, they look the same for, since the 1800s, yes. right? And, and we should have uh, we, we, we should be here, able to do better, right? Yes. We should be able to, we are, we are demanding more from our businesses. We are starting to demand more from our public sector, mm. but the, f- f- the whole political you know, beast, the whole machinery uh, is fairly analog. Yeah, totally. But it's natural, right? I mean, every industry will uh, is converging into being becoming more data-driven, mm. industry by industry. So I think politics is is, the, is somewhere down the line next. But what will be the tipping point? Because typically in, in in business and corporates, to really change and really get on the journey, mm. there, there there has been a huge compelling event. Mm. There's something happened. We are going to die. We're going to get disrupted by the the tech giants. Something is happening yep. that gets people to wake up. What needs to happen for for this industry, the political industry, yep. to wake up uh, to to become data driven? Uh, that's interesting. I mean, uh, for the um, when looking at other industries, how this data transformation has happened. Uh, it has started with the ability to co- to look at data, to collect data, that mm. we have data to work with. But this is you already, know? this is in some way, it's there, yeah, it's, I argue. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of data is there, but maybe there is a tipping point where when there is more and more data being available for for uh, for us together as a, as a society, maybe it will come to a tipping point where there is just so much, so someone will actually do this and put this together and put, put these... Uh, uh, graphs into the debate, and that will get viral, and maybe that will be like the transformative. Uh, yeah, so we, we have we have an abundance of data, but we have a scarcity of insights in that data. So how do we go to abundance in insights? So that's also the literacy translation point yeah. that you need to have the literacy to start asking the right question, and then the literacy to what's the data points and analytical models behind yeah. those data. Perhaps it can be a simple thing. As you know, we have more and more automated fact checkers these days. Uh. You know, imagine having a live debate and someone makes a statement, and you have in seconds kind of latency a red light saying this is wrong. <laughs> but that's a, I, I like it. It's but it's a reactive thing, right? I think we need to change the, how the debate is is constructed. I mean, thinking about organizations, how to how they should work with data. You, you can't just take what you did before and then start to to. Uh, to but say like this is wrong or this is right, you should uh, re- first you should establish a common a common ground first, and then mm-hmm. you work. You look at that common common framework of data and how things are, but, are looking, and then you debate on that. But the key problem is, of course, the political parties don't want that because it be, it, it doesn't help the narrative. Exactly, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, but if some media does that, at least it would force people to avoid saying obvious wrong statements. 
So it could potentially yeah. at least help. Yeah, that's what I mean. So I think when we get enough data, and maybe we are at that point, someone will take a look at that and actually put it all together and create like a common ground for like, this is the metrics framework for society in th- in using data and then invite people to maybe a podcast like this from mm-hmm. different, different poli- but, but po- it's interesting. political parties. I would argue that this is in fact already happening but not in the sort of major media. It's, it's where you find on LinkedIn. So if you go in LinkedIn, mm-hmm. you, you will find these sort of on uh, stats of someone pulled something data together mm-hmm. to really show how it really works. And you've seen all these simple animations like how many car sales and how Tesla took mm-hmm. over. And so, so people are doing this, but a little bit like out of frustration, individuals yeah. are doing this and making it go viral but none of them are doing it in a holistic way right no so and they're and picking something that, and they find some kind of fact mm-hmm. uh, on that pr- specific uh, point and then something that supports their own view and then yeah. they push that out yeah and and, and and my argument would be more that it's, we are doing this as individuals frustrated rather than this being a, a macro movement so yeah. to speak in where where the where the public media the, the big media is sort of picking up on Data driven. I, I think this is a huge opportunity. The media house that will have the best type of data like this, or maybe even have it before the debate or something like that. I yeah. think that would draw. Totally. Draw in, it would draw in me. It would yes. sell me on, on, on listening to their. They should, esta- they should create a show where they establish some kind of metrics framework together with the parties. And then, you know, they have time before to understand that. So they can come into the debate on the. Uh, on a common ground and then the uh, debate. We should pitch this to SVT, right? You know, they have these public debates. Why don't you do this format? You will kill it. Yeah. <laughs> you will get all the viewers. I like that we <laughs> end on a um, positive note yeah. that there is a future where we will have objective political discussions happening soon. Yeah. And, and we have the election coming up, of course, this 2022 year. this year. So Let's make but it happen uh, now. Yeah. <laughs> also. Great, and great to have you here, Henrik Langren. Uh, We've known each other for quite some time. I think it's close to 10 years now or something. Yeah. Um, and you're actually the person that hired me to Spotify. Yeah, I found you. Day. I remember the first meeting in a pub somewhere drinking yes, beers. Exactly. This feels back to back, back to old, old days. So, <laughs> so you recruited Anders. Yes. That's, that's the whole point here, right? Yeah, exactly. And we know each other also through Paltorion, and you also had um, a number of connections there as well. Yeah. Uh, and we're closely connected to that. And now you're on a new journey as well, which true. I'm very much looking forward to, to hear more about. I haven't heard that much yet, mm-hmm. so that's why it's super exciting to have you here and hearing what your new um, adventures are, are really about. Yeah. And, and you also have actually... Uh, a connection to Australia, which is a common theme oh. here. He is also an Australian, oh, uh, Australian wannabe. Oh, nice. <laughs> wannabe. <laughs> so, yeah, cool. Very much looking forward to hear more about that. So, very welcome here, Henrik. Thank Langer. you. Super excited. How how would you describe yourself? Who is San Henrik, Henrik Langren? Um, yeah, who am I? I think. Um, uh, I've now been in the pitch mode for my new venture for the last. <laughs> and when did you start <laughs> the new months. venture? And, and what's the name? Of uh, it? So our uh, my new company or our new company, we're three co-founders. is yeah. called Arc Arc Capital. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I will tell you more about that in a bit, of course, yeah. if you're interested. But the uh, I've been I, I just wanted to say that I've been now in pitching mode. So I've been doing a lot of pitches. So starting to talk about myself is something that I do on repeat now. I think. <laughs> but Good. Uh, <laughs> just hit the play button. Hit the play button and, and sell it. <laughs> <laughs> sell myself. So, so what I think uh, when I've been uh, thinking about this and perfecting my pitch, uh, I usually describe myself as a. Uh, um, as something where, like, I, I'm someone who whose life circles around three things. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything seems to be around data, tech, and business. Nice. So that's kind of when I look back. Those that's my like red thread throughout my life. And um, so I started uh, coding when I was uh, six years old, actually. Nice. And so I discovered that in maths early on. And then. So are you a nerd or not? Uh, exactly. That's I don't a, think you look like really a nerd. A good question. Are you are you a true nerd or not? <laughs> So I, I uh, probably moved away from that track uh, around the, the golden dot com era. Uh, those were the days uh, where when I was working as a developer, uh, it was super fun. But I realized that I um, uh, was also interested in the business side of things. So I wanted to add that to my to understand that I like mm-hmm. how our business is run. How does it work? Yeah. Um, so that's why I kind of left the uh, the programming uh, hardcore nerder uh, nerd track. So the, you were a coder. 
I was a coder. You, you can put coder on your resume. I think definitely. That's, I built a lot of cool stuff. That's cred. That's cred. <laughs> <laughs> but super fun. Um, and uh, but I realized I'm not going to be the best coder. So I, and I'm also interested in, in what you can do with it. How you know how you can use that in business or make decisions. So I went to school and then uh, studied engineering um, and then um, uh, went to McKinsey for some years uh, to understand really like. Uh, for me, it was a big black box, like how are big companies run? That sounds like super hard. But you really went over the the, um, uh, the university studies uh, in very quickly now. But yeah. okay, so what type of studies did you uh, do? Yeah, so I did the uh, Master of Science in uh, Industrial Engineering and Management. Yeah. Industrial Economy in Lean Swedish. Shipping, right? Yes, mm-hmm. shipping. it's the original. That's where it was invented. Industrial so, Engineering uh, is not Chalmers, not Kotil. Lean Shipping. Lean shipping exactly. yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> the best uh, university we have. I'm, I'm not saying that just because I went there as well. <laughs> it's, it's a true fact. Good, I think uh, we, we, don't can, <laughs> we can conclude that no, and, in and, this and, room. And speaking no, about, no, no, no facts behind that statement. Go on. Well, there is facts. Two, two data points here. Yeah, two data points. Very nicely <laughs> anecdotal evidence on that. So. Okay. Uh, no, so, um, and that's actually uh, um, interesting because when I when I uh, started that, I didn't actually at all know what uh, the, you know what. Uh, business or management or even economy really actually meant. I was a coder, right? I liked the maths and uh, liked to code, but I didn't, and I, I understood that I want, was interested in more like commercial business, how does it work? But I didn't understand exactly what it was. Mm. So when I picked, um, when I got in, I actually picked um, uh, media technique uh, as my program first, because I was uh, int- into like create, uh, creative oh. fields. Mm-hmm. And then I just added the, uh, industrial engineering or, uh, on top of that, because it was hard to get in there. And then I came in uh, by chance as a, you know, the, the last, what is it called? Uh, Re- reserve. reserve. Yeah. Reserve. So one week reserve. before the, it started, I was like, okay, you got a spot. Let's mm-hmm. go. Uh, so I was like, uh, almost uh, didn't skull. get it. <laughs> but on skull, exactly. <laughs> but I'm so happy that I got there because I, I really understood uh, after those years that this is exac- exactly what I was interested in, about. Uh, and what was the core of industrial engineering? How, how would you frame that? Because this is a quite huge in Sweden, but I'm not sure it's really, uh, it, it was really invented in Linköping, I think. Yeah, as, I think as, so, as yeah. And it's, uh, I've heard people study that in uh, Norway, of course, they're always copying us, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, also in uh, in uh, Germany, I have heard people having the same uh, kind of program. And how do you define uh, industrial engineering as a, as, as a field? Uh, uh, well, I, um, the way I talk about it is that it's a, it's a master's degree, so you do a master's, so you, and the first years are like any other, like master's of physics or uh, mechanical engineer or something like that. And But then you, you specialize in something, and where some people specialize in mechanical engineering, electrical, electrical engineering, this is specializing in business. So you do, you add the management and business side. Uh, on t- to your engineering degree. So you become like a, mi- a hybrid between. And, and I uh, think this is super cool because th- this was, I, didn't, I mean, this is quite a long time ago in Sweden that, you know, people are doing double undergrad, so yeah. double masters, like technical and business. Yeah. And how can we now combine that and frame that as one path? Mm. Exactly. And, uh, you know, looking back right now, the, the profile. Uh, really fit me well because I'm, I am this generalist person. This, I said those three circles, right? Tech, um, uh, data, business, and business. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I, I love that intersection between. So I really, that was perfect fit for, for me, that, uh, that program. But you also ended up in Australia somehow. How did that come about? Yeah, because I think uh, almost all people in, uh, in uh, that program, industrial engineering, uh, is, uh, are doing uh, uh, exchange programs. Uh, right. So you, uh, I think a lot of them of us uh, go uh, study abroad. So, uh, and where were you? In Australia, first in Sydney and then in Brisbane. Specifically, where were you? Which uni? Oh, which uni? Uh, at UTS in Sydney. Yes. And then uh, QUT in, uh, in Brisbane. Queensland University. Queensland University. Yeah. Cool. So that was a great time. And I uh, have my bachelor from University of Wollongong. And one of my friends... And you can never spell it right, right? I can now, but you can't. <laughs> no, I cannot. <laughs> I've been there, though. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but one of my best friends and roommates uh, transferred to UTS because he thought, oh, it would be better to have a degree from UTS than Wollongong. And I said, well, that's just bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you study? I studied business marketing right. uh, and uh, more specifically services and relationship marketing. Mm. So I was uh, early on intrigued. Uh, I went to Technis in, in, uh, in Borås, mm-hmm. and, but I'm not an engineer and business. And then this is, oh, you know, 92, 93, I, I 
I don't know how I, I ended up being fascinated by kundklubbar, you know, one-to-one -one type marketing. So this is 93, 92. We talk about one-to-one -one marketing, which is data-driven. Yeah. So I data, see. you know, so I, if I would do your, uh, I would be like the business or the marketing and sales and data. Right. And then Makes services sense. and relationship yeah. marketing. And, and, you know, it, it, we didn't, call, you didn't call it CRM. No. Relationship marketing, services marketing. Cool. In, awesome. anyway. Yeah, and, and then somehow you, you came back, back to Sweden as well, and you got in contact to McKinsey, right? In yeah, some way. How, exactly. how did that happen? Uh, so when I was um, uh, done with my studies, I f still felt that uh, even though that was a great introduction for me to understand more about the business, uh, I still like didn't have enough. So I still didn't, didn't really get it. So I had the choice back then to go like, okay, I know that I can code, right? I'm a developer. So I could go back in, into coding, but I felt like I really want to understand more business side. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I followed this uh, massive uh, uh, flow from people go, going and studying industrial engineering to consultancy. Management so consultancy. Management consultancy. This, and this was, was very shit popular, in, right? in the 90s and 2000s. Exactly. That, that you were not thinking startup, management consulting. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, so I followed that to, uh, and, I, and that was also a very good um, choice for me because it was like yeah, three years of uh, probably the best uh, school. business school I could ever go to. It's just fascinating. And how would you describe McKinsey for people that don't know it? What, what do they do? Um, so uh, we or they or yeah, whatever. And McKinsey, at my, at my, actually I've heard now that a lot of things have uh, changed. So maybe my version is not correct anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, at that time, at least we were helping um, uh, any organization to do um, to, to run management uh, projects, making decisions, run the, uh, programs that they would like transform their business into something, something that didn't work or something that they wanted to develop. Uh, and then they wanted to get help to from uh, people who had done that before and are like experts in running such projects. Uh, so that's what we were doing. But I think uh, what uh, I li really liked at the time is the, the whole um, uh, way McKinsey was structured. Uh, they talked a lot about doing the dual mission, like helping uh, their um, um, uh, hel helping their clients to really like have a significant positive impact on the clients, so make sure that there, there is a change, and not just uh, you know a, a lot of slides <laughs> in a presentation. Yes. Uh, but the other uh, goal, um, which was on equal importance, uh, was to also develop the people that worked there, uh, and I think they really did that well. Uh, and I think even my first or maybe it was second day uh, at McKinsey, I was thrown into a meeting with the CFO of a, like a big multi-billionaire, uh, you know, company. Mm. Um, of course, I didn't know anything uh, myself, but thanks to the support from the team, uh, how we were organized, I could already feel empowered in that meeting to say things to really be helpful for them. So I think yeah. it was like a really good way to, to like develop people really, really fast by throwing them out giving them you know parts uh, of knowledge so that they could us could we could be uh, knowledgeable uh, and then uh, we that was a really really rapid way for us to learn a lot of things very fast what year is this uh, this is 2007 and you became an expert in how to run businesses, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Time, right? uh, and very, again, very generalist uh, way. So yeah. the way it works at McKinsey is you start, uh, you know, it's really a clear pyramid way. So mm. you come in, you know nothing, you, mm. and then uh, you just learn from the projects that you're in, but you don't have any specializations. And, and then the longer you stay, the more focused you get into like areas where you have built, built up experience. Could, could you summarize some core of key trajectory <coughs> type of profile of in initiatives and projects that you were most involved with did you, did you get a path sort of thing no i did i didn't get that path so it was like still after three years very random very like whatever uh, no fo no focus for me so it was everything from doing like a five-year strategic plan uh, uh, of a, like a big retail chain to be down on the um uh, on the factory floor clocking different people working in a factory right mm -hmm. so it's like super different uh, mm -hmm. types of work which is great for me but also what actually I, I started feeling after three years now I got what I need I understand much more about how businesses are run and how decisions are make it made but I wanted to go back to tech so like I, I still have the real tech in my DNA so the nerd was there the nerd was there <laughs> uh, so but I couldn't really get that uh, focus uh, and I also like um, really itched in my fingers to create to be part of building things myself, not just be a, an advisor. 
So that led you into the next step, right? Exactly. How did that happen? And um, what was that? Yeah, that was... Um, um, uh, so when I felt like this three years in at, at McKinsey, I felt like my... my uh, I, my learning curve was a bit uh, flattening, flattening off a bit, uh, and it was also a bit predictive. I felt like if I stay here, I'm, I know exactly what I will do the next 10 years, and that I realize now is not what I thrive with. Yes. I want to learn, and, and I love the, un the uncertain stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, my uh, colleague uh, back then, Johan Persson, uh, oh. who is now called Johan Forshud, um, he uh, was at McKinsey, a colleague of mine, and then he went to Spotify because he was then uh, helping uh, Daniel Ek with his uh, special projects um, uh, that Daniel had. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when, uh, when Johan Daniel left... Daniel is the founder of Spotify. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, when, so when Johan left, I told him that that's exactly a company that sounds super interesting to, for me to join. You were basically showing off... Oh. Damn it, you yeah. got the perfect job. Exactly. So <laughs> I said, if you need more people, let me know. And then two weeks later, he said, we need more people. Do you want to come? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so that's uh, how that happened. But uh, I mean, this is so fun because we've had several guests with, with some Spotify pedigree, so to speak. And uh, we sat here joking, I think it was Lale, and, and you were, uh, what number did you have, Anders? And, and right. uh, so what year is this and how, how what's early? What's my number? <laughs> yeah, what's your number, man? <laughs> I think we were 120 people, if I remember correctly, when that's I joined. No, that's and were you in beta then, or were you in production? No, that uh, was, uh, it was uh, really, so this was 2010, so, um, so you were, yeah, it was you, late. Yeah, but this <laughs> beyond beta and commercial, the commercial model was up there, because I, I remember what, the first time I in, envisioned, spot, uh, met Spotify, yeah. so to speak, one of my friends at the, uh, the work I was, they, oh, we, 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 had a, we were playing music, and we, oh, it's for free, and where, what's this? This is Spotify, it's a beta. I can't remember what year yeah. it was, but. Be a little bit after that, I yeah, think. Yeah, so. after that, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, but it was, uh, I, back then I felt like, wow, this is, uh, it would have been fun to be part in this early on. Yeah. Uh, now it's too late, but of course <laughs> it wasn't, right? Quite early. <laughs> and what was your, what did you start working with at that time? Um, so I, um, uh, I ended up having a, a similar role as Joanne. So we were two of us having this like special projects role. So helping right. out with whatever things that uh, Daniel and the management team needed help with. Mm -hmm. uh, but very early on, when I got, uh, when I approached a running a, some kind of project with them, for them, I said, well, well, then to make this decision, we need to have data, right? right. Um, and uh, then we figured that, we saw that, well, wait, we don't have any data. There is very little data here to work with, and there is no team that I can work with who can actually provide me with this data. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, uh, at that time, I said, uh, you need to have, I think you need to build a, a data team um, mm -hmm. to Daniel. And then uh, in true startup uh, sense, he said, that's a good idea. Why don't you build that for me? <laughs> <laughs> is this pre the famous server? The firm, the for, is this pre the first Horton cluster? Uh, no, yeah. so this is, yeah, this is yeah. pre, uh, or, or this is during, I would during, say, because yeah. um, uh, the good thing about uh, that time was that we had great developers, right, yeah. uh, who uh, all of them were like eager to try out the latest and greatest in, in tech. Uh, so some people had already picked uh, this uh, Hadoop, the, 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 the yeah, technology. Hadoop, sorry, no, it was, it was Hadoop a pure in Hadoop. The cl closet. Exactly. Uh, the Hadoop in the closet, it yeah. was not Horton, sorry, not Horton, exactly. Ho uh, the Hadoop in the closet. <laughs> Horton came later, actually. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> exactly. No, so we had the great people this. in the team that had picked that uh, technology already and uh, started working, playing with it. Um, so that was uh, like a, a few people who were involved in that. So I kind of tried to put them all together and make this into uh, a, a more, a bit more structured organization, and then staff it up with more, more people on the um, tech side, but also uh, on the um, uh, analytics side. So who could actually an analyze this data and make that, make better decisions out of it. Mm. Uh, basically what we said we need for the for the politicians right so uh, <laughs> I, I saw on, on your LinkedIn profile vice president analytics right so that was go and do something Daniel said why don't you fix the data then if you want analysis yeah exactly. you, 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 you become VP an you, you become VP analytics that's exactly how it works <laughs> <laughs> and, and but and how was that how did you interpret that role at that point in time or what how did you how would you <clears> look <throat> at your OKRs back you know what were they um, yeah, in the beginning it was, um, uh, I mean, we were very early on to, to start to explore how can we work with this data? How can we make better decisions with 
all this amount of data. We, I mean, we were early on to, to, to have all these different events, but basically you can say like every click of every user in a data set. That's an, an mm -hmm. enormous amount of data that no one had actually looked at before. So in the beginning, it was just like helping out to figure out, uh, make sure that we have that data available, like just having that. And, and, and remember, it didn't mostly work at all. Uh, so we had to do a lot of work or the developers too. But do you remember, so. can you remember what were the first questions that you wanted to have answered? What's the insights or decisions that you wanted to support? Yeah. What I, was your first use case? I mean, the, one of the very first one was to, uh, it was at the time where, when, um, uh, it was a lot of debate on how to restrict Spotify uh, because uh, this was linked to label discussions where uh, we want mm. to, or they wanted to enforce different types of restrictions. So uh, um, and eventually it, it led up to uh, us having to say that every user can only play one track for on the free side for five times ever. Mm. After that, it should be like blocked and you cannot play the same song again. Super complex and uh, cumbersome <laughs> thing to, to implement. Uh, implement uh, and also for the users, really, really awful. Uh, but uh, uh, that actually did happen. But before that, it was a lot of uh, analysis around that. So how can we make, rest uh, like, if we are about to create restrictions, what should we do? And, and this was the record labels that had crazy ideas in the beginning before they understood where yes, this was going. Yes, exactly. Because at that time, the power, power balance was yeah. di uh, very yeah. different, right? Uh, but then, uh, since we had that data, of course, we wanted them to, like, how can we use this data to understand and uh, get informed in that decision? How can we simulate that? Uh, so together with Eric Bernason, who, um, he would, we did a lot of great uh, work to simulate uh, this. Uh, I remember we called it the snowball analysis. So what if, like looking into how people's behaviors were at that time, like how many times do you listen to a track? How many would, would uh, hit the cap? Uh, and what do we believe about their uh, churn uh, probabilities afterwards? And what will that lead to? If we have the cap at five or at 10 or 20 or in hours, like playing out with different scenarios like that. That was one of the first things we tried. Super cool. And you continue to grow that for, for some time and you built a graph team as well. That's right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you forgot about that. <laughs> and, uh, and so many more things. A any like big highlights that you would like to <coughs> mention perhaps during your Spotify years? Um, oh, there are so many. Um, but I think, yeah, I think in general, just seeing how this, um, this new ability that we could see so much and we could simulate at this level that I just mentioned everywhere uh, and see how that tr transformed the way we worked in all the different functions. So now we talked about uh, how to simulate that, those uh, possible uh, limitations using customer behavior. But then thinking about the same we did for uh, for doing marketing. We, we are super early on to do performance marketing, right? And, and it's the same um, philosophy we apply there too. So, okay, we can actually see which users we, uh, that we pay for, like when they come in, what do they do? What's the value of that? And, and we, could, uh, uh, we could get much more granular in that. And it's so, so cool to see how that transformed everything we did and we made us much better uh, in, in like the general decision-making. Uh, and then uh, also the psychological aspect of that, so how that changed how people work, how, how they view themselves and how they should view their own views uh, of how the world works. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for example, I remember some people in the in the design team. First time we talked to them about like, okay, you have built a great design here, but actually, we, you know, we've seen in data that people react in this way. Uh, so maybe we could try something like this. And the immediate reaction for someone who's never use data like that is like, well, you know, I know how this works. Don't come to me and, and uh, tell me how users uh, think here. I, I know how this works. Mm. Uh, and then uh, um, seeing how we got from that point to actually getting data as a very p a natural part of, of the, even the designer's uh, tool toolkit and how that made them even better, right? Mm. Uh, same with everywhere. Uh, I think that uh, that was a big uh, uh, takeaway for, for myself that but still holds. And I think it's still also going back to the politicians, something that they will need to go through if they are ever going to be really data driven. But, but you, you, you're, you, you're hitting a really raw nerve in a good way now, because when you're driving and, and explaining your big highlight, uh, like one of the key highlights, mm -hmm. um, I mean, like Spotify in many ways in Sweden is one of the real poster childs of how would you define a data-driven business yeah. in, in Sweden. And everybody looks up to Spotify and forgets you started from scratch in thinking about data as well. Yeah. You happen to be part of that process. Yeah. Now, 
could you under, could you reflect if there were some instrumental moments or instrumental moves you did that made this happen or accelerated your data driven that this took on because it could have been used in another project and then oh well, that's not really cool we do something else yeah. so why did it stick you know could you could you reflect on that those instrumental moments that makes the data driven mindset stick how, how what did you do that um yeah i mean um it, we the the first thing i think was to uh that we did manage to get all of that data okay as a first place and we could and not everyone can right and you, especially but you worked at that time. really hard just struggling to get yeah. the data and that was thanks to the um, i think it all started with um, with a very complex reporting needs yeah. of spotify that we had to report every stream we uh, the the we had logic that actually uh dependent uh, was depending on like to figure out how much money everyone should get you had to actually look at every single stream so we had to al- early, uh, already very early on f- find um, solutions for how can we actually calculate that and this was before my time in the beginning uh, so, but i think that was so a, that is actually meaning that to re- to to some degree have a, have a grip on data for the core business model it was ingrained in the core culture and business model early on that's a problem for many that they don't have that. Yeah, no, I think maybe the culture, the general data-driven culture probably come, came later when we started to use that data for, for, for business okay. decisions. Mm. But we couldn't get there unless we had, uh, we, we, we had the ability to store all the data. And we couldn't get there unless we started, I think, by, uh, by these uh, complex reporting requirements that forced us to use this technology that, that allowed us to store so all the, the, first, the It first helped us to get very early on in that. Really good point. Uh, but I think the other thing, uh, uh, is to um, I think this initiative to start the analytics team uh, that Daniel um, asked me or I asked him and he asked me back. I think it was uh, it was a crucial point to get that centralized early on um, uh, in the journey. And then the because really that top support. Really the top re- support. Real top I mean, support. I was I was reporting to Daniel Ek as the, this uh, um, head of analytics as uh, for several years in the beginning, uh, mm-hmm. and I think very few companies have done, have that. done that. And that made it very centralized, right? So in all the the different management meetings, I was mm-hmm. there. I was like all the time trying to think about um, uh, how can we get data on what we're discussing right now. So not stack three layers down, five exactly. layers down. Exactly. So I think that was very important. So you could then indoctrinated data agenda in the real meetings. Yeah, exactly. And after after meetings, like uh, taking people aside and like, maybe I have uh, some ideas where maybe we can find something in what we're discussing now. And we then you had relationships. Now. You yeah, had exactly. the network. And the context of the important questions that are really matters for the company right now. Because sitting <sighs> in... Uh, sitting with all this data and just sifting through and create analysis and graphs that no one uses, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. So, so it has to be connected to what really matters for the company. So and to get that, you need to you know, bring data to those questions. But I, I, I tried to summarize because this is super strong points. If you have a VP analytics at some point, really, really high up in the organization, it means that that person, you are indoctrinated by the real business questions. Mm. So when you go down and talk to the tech team, you heard it from the horse's mouth. Yeah. And this is a huge difference to working on the floor, so to speak. Yes. And sitting with all that data, but you don't really know the agenda that really kills it. That's exactly. a key moment. I think also, you know, Daniel has an engineering background himself. Yeah. Um, do you think that's an important part? Do you Definitely. Think, do you think like CEOs or the uh, top management team should have an engineering background? Uh, d- you don't probably have to have an engineering background, but I think uh, if if the CEO has a like a data driven mindset, mm. like trying to find objective facts for her, his or her decisions, then of course that's going to uh, define the culture for how uh, how the rest of the management team works as well. Mm. Yeah, so many stories there, and, and I remember you know you trying to force me to to come early to Spotify at some point, and you I think the the big lore that you had was that they had a big Spotify party in the summer summer party <laughs> that's and why you had started <laughs> and then you never real, told me that that was your real hook. reason <laughs> <laughs> I, you already hooked me before that but, but you said you know if i leave the other company early on you know you will actually be able to join this you know, insane <laughs> party where they bring all the employees from all over the world he never told me this <laughs> oh, cool. he's shallow he's a shallow man yeah, exactly. he, he loves beer but it was a really, really like dancing too i know yes <laughs> dance strange, yeah 
but it was a. Yeah. But but let it's let me ask this question. Yeah. You know, let's be a little bit personal. How did you t- two guys meet, or how did you get your eyes on Andres? How did you pinpoint Andres, or what? How why did you want him, and why did you want him, and why did you fall in love? And <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm joking. And how did you get married? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? There? No, but what's the story here? Because you, I think you were courting him a little bit before he joined. Um, Is that correct? A court thing. I, I, I asked him to join, and he said no first, and then later no, on. He, no, did he no, tell no, you that? No, he was easy. He uh, was an easy catch. <laughs> just, you know, I'm really hard joking. Is, is, uh, I'm, no, I'm but joking, I think no. I think um, uh, at that time, what, when when was it? 2011, something. 12, I think. 12. Uh, then we had come uh, quite far on the on building building out the analytics team, and I think. Um, um, macro wise um, this technology even started to get traction as like big data that that coin was termed it was starting to be, be a big thing right? big yeah. data was the, the shit that's the shit that's the hype train uh, so like um, this started to become a, a big thing and at the same time machine learning got this it, uh, um, comeback right from the winter thanks to, to the data um, evolution because suddenly we had data to work with and uh, Spotify had great uh, machine learning engineers uh, for to build the recommendation systems and things like that, which was great. Uh, but for the analytics piece, we didn't really have that. Mm. So in our team, we did not have uh, machine learning expertise because no one had done that for like analytics purposes mm. at the time. Uh, so I thought uh, it would be great to have that, like explore how can we use machine learning practices for the analytics purposes. Uh, and then I wanted to find who should I work with. And then um, I did... Uh, but I think you always need to do, like, do spend hours to find who is the best person to talk to here, to and then try to to uh, trick them to come over, <laughs> join. And um, how did you did you have a connection, or how did you? No, it, it was a pure LinkedIn search. LinkedIn from my side. search. <laughs> LinkedIn. Uh. Cold, cold outbound. Yeah. But it was, it, it's of, it of course helps with. Uh, I think that premise at the time we had uh, a strong early brand, even at that yeah. time. I think. Yeah, you had. Yeah. Uh, and also we had a lot of data. So yeah. for anyone interested in this field, it's a perfect thing for, for uh, to, to, to join Spotify, of course. Yeah. And where were you at that point in time? I forget, you were at um, Campania. Campania then, right? I mean, I think I remember one of the questions you asked me the first time we met at this um, uh, yeah, pub or cafe or whatever it was. Um, and it was something about, you know, how to deduplicate things. And I remember I actually did a very similar type of work in, in a previous place that I worked with. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I still remember that. It's, it's so, a so it's a little bit like, yes, he asked me the right question. <laughs> <laughs> and he offers me a party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was later, actually. It wasn't the, uh, anyway, cool times. And, yeah. Good, um, good and story, by that. the way. Good yeah. story, thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, should we move on as well to, you also moved to EQT. And, and I think, you know, we can mention also, you know, wh- when you left, because I think that was a big controversy. And a lot of people, you was really upset about that <laughs> and how that <laughs> happened. Uh, I've never seen so many people being upset at that time. <laughs> what um, was that all about? Um, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a tricky topic that I have uh, not much answers to, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. We, we can skip that. But I, I think everyone was really upset when you left uh, as well. And... Um, but at the same time, I had been there for five and a half years, so I think um, it was. Uh, I fe- I felt that I started to. I love the building phase, the creative, mm. like being part of the early uh, um, days of something. And at that point, I'd been there so long, so teams were big. I think I had seventy-five people, and everything was kind of rolling. Uh, and um, um, it's a different stage. It, it was a lot of politics about the U.S. versus Stockholm. Yes, exactly. It wasn't so much fun, and I had to more to work as a, act as a kind of a shield uh, for our team versus the rest of the org than, than doing what I loved most, uh, which was their, this early phase. Yeah. So I felt that uh, at the same time that what I've learned, it's just so unique, right? All the experiences that Less we had developed. What so can I do with this? Yeah, this is a lot more important and valuable every or other places. And if I can use that to create something new, that that would be uh, very and interesting. But and, and what uh, was it? AQT was this uh, stage of the Spotify. Yeah, exactly. You, what was the trigger? Or why was AQT interesting? Uh, so I think at, uh, after Spotify, I did uh, a bit of soul searching. Where should I? Uh, where should I apply this now? Where, where should I go next? Should I do? 
uh, I explore different routes. Uh, should I use this uh, new uh, knowledge of mine to uh, to join another startup early phase, uh, or should I go to uh, like a big, uh, uh, big in, like s- incumbent org to try to sh- change them, transform them, transform them? That could be an well, option. Welcome to my world. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I did uh, I did uh, um, yeah did meet uh, many of them, and I actually did also talk to. The uh, ex-consultants, or my, not ex, the consultants again, and see should I go back there because that would also be an interesting choice. So I did explore, like actually I did end up with eight different uh, offers uh, before to really like get to like. So the you detail. were you were hot, you were hot. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> uh, but then that was good for me because then I, I I had to do that to really challenge myself. What what is it that I really want next? And then uh, this thing um, uh, to at UKT really resonated best with me. And um, what was that? Why? Yeah, so then uh, it was to create something new, like uh, be part of, of crafting something from the beginning. So this was to create a new ventures fund. Uh, and I really love that. Uh, and, the wh- and the reasons for why uh, f- I mean, we wanted to do to build EQT Ventures as a, a new th- new type of fund that didn't exist in Europe at the time. It was oh, so you were part of building that fund as well? Yeah. Oh, so who, who, was, who, 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 who pitched you? Who got you in? Uh, it was... Um, uh, the one who connected me should get credit for that is Sofia Benz. Yeah. So she uh, she knew Yalmar yeah. Vindal, who uh, uh, was uh, like the godfather of, uh, yeah, yeah. of that. Um, so oh, well. they connect or she connected us. We had Aurora Belfrog here right. on the show yeah. not so long ago, and she she he, 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 she spoke to him like he was God. Yeah. I, I'm joking, <laughs> but, but you know we, 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 he's impressive. Yeah, definitely, and. Um, uh, so we met, and then I really liked uh, what we what, what they had thought together. Or thought about what they wanted to create, like a big, a different thing, a different venture fund. And because from my Spotify days, I I met with uh, probably all the investors at the other side of the table because they were coming to us when we were pitching yeah. uh, for our rounds at Spotify. And then all the time, I had to or we had to educate them on how they should look at our business, right? Because we were far ahead of like metrics and data and stuff. So we had to educate them. And then I was thinking like, what if we cr- can create another new modern investor that actually looks at things in the right way? Um, That's a cool proposition. Yeah, of course. Uh, and the other was the, um, and the, of course, the data-driven aspect of uh, like, m- what if we make a, of course, we should use all the data that is out there uh, about companies to, to figure out which companies we should talk to first. So the mothering concept. Yeah, I see what you're going there. But yeah. before we go there, perhaps you can just explain, you know, what, would, what was the main ideas about the EQT ventures compared to the classical EQT uh, investments? That they yeah, were? so the... Um, uh, so actually, we talked about EQT Ventures as only the Ventures Fund first. So and the main first, the, or the four pillars of why we want to create a new fund was to create uh, a big fund. So the first fund was 566 million euros. How much? Five, 566. Million. And that's euro. Million euro. And that was uh, very different from all the other funds in Europe because we saw that there's a big gap in Europe. There is no big funds in Europe. Every no, big fund is in, in the US. US. Yeah. So that was a big one, thing, one of the big things. Um, and uh, that was where I love ambitions, right? So I, I wanted to create <laughs> world-class stuff. Uh, so that love, I love that. And the other thing was the, uh, to have a team of not bankers running the fund, but actually having a team of people from, that had been part of tech uh, stars before. Right. Mm. There, there weren't that many in Europe that had been part of, of the unicorn uh, journeys. Uh, so we collected a really strong team of people uh, like myself, but also from Booking and from King. Mm-hmm. Uh, so th- I really love that. So and because I could also relate to it. If I could talk to people that had done tech startups uh, so before, cool environment. like if I could, when I was head of analytics and could talk to people that had done that, that would be really, really helpful, I thought. Mm-hmm. I like that part, that's the second thing. And the third thing was the data-driven part. So let's what if we try trying to do a really data-driven fund? That's oh. the mother brain project. And the fourth thing was, let's do it um, as a new fund, but we don't want to do everything ourselves. So let, how can we build this on top of another platform? And that was where EQT came in. Because with EQT, we could get a lot of things um, uh, for free. <laughs> Not for free, but uh, together so as a joint thing. So w- we could build it on top of uh, EQT's all the experiences and all the infrastructure with HR and fund management and everything. So is, could you say, uh, is EQT Ventures sprung out of EQT or is it someone who comes up and pitches and we, you partner up sort of thing? 
if, uh, you, if you look at the mechanism here. Yeah. Because you're almost saying now, like Yalman, sort of the, we want to work with you. We have this idea. Can we be a yeah, branch of you? Exactly. I think uh, Yalmar had been an advisor for EQT for long before that too. Yes. So it's so kind he, of he had hybrid. Order the network and relationships yeah. and the conversations were there. I guess he was kind of developing this idea already with yes, EQT in mind, right? So I think, yeah. Super cool. Cool. And can you mention perhaps some uh, companies that the Equity Ventures were investing in? Some highlights from that time? Um, yeah, I, we invested in uh, 100 companies before I left, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a lot. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, most valuable, value, uh, valued companies so far, uh, I think, is Volt, mm -hmm. uh, which was just exited uh, to DoorDash. Uh, or, um, or uh, um, uh, yeah, that was uh, yeah, just this fall. So um, uh, that's a really, really uh, cool journey, and that was one of the very first investments. So that's uh, it takes a lot of time, right? To and how long time did it take before the exit for Revolt? Uh, so we did that just when I joined, which was um, January sixteen, I think, to now. Mm. Five years. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And well, so basically, you you were there when you set this up. So you started with like now you have a hundred investments, and how many investments was on? The, you were there setting it up. Yeah, literally. exactly. So when so I joined, so. just uh, so th when I joined, uh, we uh, had uh, or the Yalmar did some kind of first invest, very very earlier uh, investment, like a test investment first, like pre even before it was official, I think. But the first close of the fund was just uh, the month after I uh, joined. Uh, but then it was like the pre-launch. Uh, so the relaunch was in May. So it was, uh, yeah, it was early on. Mm. And then also you were instrumental in something called Mother Brain as well. It sounds like something from uh, HAL 9000 or something. But what's Mother Brain and, and what yeah. do they try to do? Uh, so that was the... Um, uh, really, the 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 way I think about it is at least uh, it's the manifestation of everything uh, about working with data to make uh, our investments better, and that could be anything from sourcing to doing the analysis to helping the companies with whatever they need help with uh, to exits. Uh, so that was the, our 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 vision uh, that this is like everything we do as VCs can be automated and data driven, right? That's the the vision of D that. Did Mother Brain like when it was <coughs> con conceived? Did it have a very like a, like a clear s objective or clear mission statement? Um, yes, but it has evolved. Yes, of course. Uh, which I think is is natural and how you should do it because it's. Imp possible to know in the beginning uh, what you uh, everything that it, it should do. So I think uh, if we all agree on that, uh, so what I felt when I started that we could probably all agree that, you know, 10 years from now, I said, or we said that uh, then a lot of the things we do today will be automated and be, be much better done using data. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's just how it's going to be. Could we all agree on this and what is then the steps that we can exactly. do to be positioned? Exactly. Super so where smart. do we start, right? Uh, and um, uh, and then so it's impossible to figure out exactly how to do everything. But we all agree on that's that's going to be the this case is the in the, the future. General direction the direction is there. Direction is clear. And then we try all the time to then. Uh, f um, I love the the bets framework from Spotify. Yeah. Uh, the to just then. Okay. So here we are right now with the resources we have. Where should we bet on to make the most out of you know this next period of of uh, a quarter or something like that to get us towards the Future. Mm. Uh, Perhaps you could elaborate a bit more because I don't think people understand the bets framework. This, this can you really just um, describe a bit more what that uh, is really all about? Yeah, um, I mean, when I was there, it was uh, called the dibs. It's mm. probably called something else today. But uh, in, in um, uh, just the notion of having uh, when you make decisions, you mean you you, uh, you want to collect data about something. Um, you should just co make sure that you have the data about uh, you know the context of the decision you're about to make. From there, you uh, would want to phrase uh, uh, insights to what does this tell you. So, so what data are the to ins insights? It's dibs and data exactly. insights. Data to insight. We go now. Yep. So you f you uh, just don't not just um, you shouldn't just be happy with the data, but just formulate the relevant insights that you can see the facts of that data. 
Uh, and then what does it tell you? And, and then here is uh, the beliefs. So we believe. So here are here you kind of lose the facts a bit because uh, you want to formulate what the are the beliefs, the hypothesis of, of our company right now based on these insights. What do we believe in from this? But still connected to the, to the insights. So you force yourself to connect your beliefs into data points. Mm. Uh, and then from there, uh, you have uh, beliefs on what you think you, you uh, want to do or things, uh, uh, opportunities that you could do if you want. And then it's about the prioritization. So where, where should we focus? Where, what should we do? And instead of just saying that uh, we should do all these things, this is the roadmap for the next three years, uh, bec uh, then uh, let's not do that because we don't know what will work, how we should do things. We will have to learn on the go. Uh, and then uh, let's make sure from the insights beliefs, uh, uh, then uh, let's make some bets on what do we believe right now should be our best uh, uh, effort on getting towards the, so the future vision. Second B, bets. Uh, or? No, it was beliefs. Beliefs, beliefs. yes. So, and then the, the last, uh, or the second B is bets. So yeah, the insights I mean. beliefs, bets, yes. I, that's what I meant. <laughs> yeah. um, so, but uh, I think also a lot of companies are and, and I'm going to be a bit offensive now, uh, so sorry for that. But I think so many people that are driven more, or companies that are driven more by accountants are looking much more into second month, second quarter, and trying to optimize that, but don't have the more long-term kind mm. of bets in place, right? Exactly. So um, uh, so I think to make those bets, you need to make sure what you're betting towards. Mm -hmm. right? So you need to formulate the, the vision or the direction for something further ahead. Mm -hmm. And that's more than just one quarter ahead or two quarters right. away. So yes. that's important, right? And that's how you evaluate what, um, which of all these opportunities should we bet on right now. Mm. Uh, and uh, you, bet on t you bet on the things that you believe right now with everything you know, with the data that you have right now, had the highest chance to take you towards uh, mm. the, um, the future and direction. And it's a single but bet as well. It's multiple bets that you're trying to work. Yeah, with. exactly. But you also cannot bet on everything. So you, you have to focus, right? So you yes. pick on, um, and, and you don't make it like, let's be bet the five next years on this. You make it in, mm. into sizable chunks that you can, like you form, a, you scope them down to something that you can bet on right now that is like a, yeah, it's a, a piece of uh, like a step towards something. Can you give an example of a bet? Like, uh, how would you frame? Uh, is that a project? Is it a use case? Is, is it a direction? Is it a key result? Uh, it's uh, it's more like a company bet, uh, where it, uh, it doesn't have to be linked to just a team or anything like that. It could be uh, we believe uh, we will, now we want, we believe uh, that uh, mobile is going to take over the world because uh, we see that in the data, and uh, we're going to bet on making a. Uh, uh, a sign-up flow that actually allows people to sign up on their mobile phone. Because they didn't have that uh, when I started, Good right? Um, so let's make a bet on that. We, because we believe that that's going to help us a lot. We don't know, like, should we build a complete iPad app and everything on mobile? We don't know yet, but let's start on this. Uh, and then we see what happens. I mean, I think that's a good example in the Spotify days as well, where that's one of the few companies that actually be made a really big transformation mm. going from desktop first to mobile first. Yes. Right? And that was in 2011 or something? Yeah, like? uh, or yeah, 11 and 12. Uh, yeah. So when we, 11, we launched the US. Yeah. And I remember then we did not have uh, the, the free version of mobile. So I remember like, talking about like, when we launched in the US, we're going to have big announcements on stages uh, everywhere. Like lots of people will hear about Spotify for the first mm -hmm. time. Uh, they will check that on their phone. Mm. Isn't it weird that they cannot sign up on the phone? <laughs> That's no, weird. No brainer. <laughs> That's so simple. Now it's a no brainer, right? But at that time, no, it, was, it was like. But when you stated yeah, like that. You're right. That's a good idea. You know, because you have, the, you have the conversion point right there. And yeah. then you're not going to take it. It's, it's hilarious. We didn't have that. At the time, <laughs> but it's also, I mean, it's so obvious today, but in 2010, no, you know, they, they didn't think obvious. about, I mean, no. then you, you didn't think mobile would be but as that's, big that's as. That's why I love the bets. This, the, I mean, like you ask a little bit, like we are stuck in, in the, in the planning horizon, yada, yada, yada two months, three months. Mm. I argue mm. it, 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 it's a different type of steering because you have plan driven steering, which is more traditional, stable business uh, supply and demand that fundamentally doesn't work. Those metrics does not work in a startup or in a great uh, uncertainty. Mm. So you need to have an, I call it plan driven versus hypothesis driven. Yes. And I argue that most of the companies, this is the real transformation they're going through, not the data transformation in the steering of Scania. Mm. How do I, because now they, they understand that if I do this on Scania, right? Data points are the transport 
ecosystem. The insight is that there will be different types of roles and, and, and aggregators. Our belief is, you know, yeah. we, we, we want to go sell transport solution. This is clear. Then trying to put that into plans according to plan economy doesn't work. No. Instead of going down what are our biggest hypotheses and how do we steer our investments towards our bets. Yeah. And th this is a huge difference in how a corporate yes. traditional 100-year company is steered. But because you cannot make the plans because you don't have the data about it. No. Right? So it's, it's impossible. And that's why I love the, the bet. It's not a project. It's a bet because that uh, emphasizes that you don't know. Yes. And I think that's a, so important, which and, and, is a, a and, and, and big and managerial you, chi shift. And then you get to the famous, we should be the best of feeling fast uh, type quotes mm -hmm. that you love to, to yes. tell, because they all fit together now. Yeah. To say and them you without take a context. Risk, I mean, you shouldn't just, you know, do what the, the, the has worked in the past. You may, must make some kind of bet yeah. on something that you don't know if it will work. No, but, but, but Daniel's ex risk. quote sounds crazy. We are, we are going to be the best to fail fast mm -hmm. in a plan again scheme kind of way no you know we don't know so we're going to understand we're going to test we're going to bet and then we're going to fail fast when we see that this bet is wrong yes so when you put that statement in the right context it makes so much then it's profound in my opinion yes. yeah. awesome this is good no, stuff I, by yeah. the way. I'm, I'm a nice, nice topic i think about you know bets and how we can think above the quarterly kind of planning that so yeah. many others are st getting st stuck in. But back to mother brains, you know, and, and uh, we also had William yeah. previously on yeah. the show as well. Willem, and, yes. Um, Willem, yes. And um, perhaps we can just, you know, recap a bit, you know, what is the, the approach that mother brain is <coughs> taking to, I guess, what is what are they really trying to do? Are they ba basically trying to find the next best investments or how would you define what their main goal is? Um, yeah, so um, uh, it started, as we said, the, the vision has evolved during the years, yeah. which is uh, good and natural. Uh, and uh, it started, and I think the, one of the biggest uh, uh, things we have built so far is the sourcing part, mm. where it's about finding the, the, the companies to invest in. Yes. Uh, and uh, I mean, that part is really not rocket science when you start thinking about it. It's a lot of data available about companies out there, uh, a lot of them, like uh, data about how companies are trending on app stores, uh, how uh, uh, the web uh, traffic is routed to the different, um, to the websites, uh, data about uh, teams that are on these uh, uh, companies uh, and what they did before. A lot of this data is, is um, data that is, of course, correlated with if you're interested in, in uh, looking at this company or not. So when thinking about the investment decision, what, are, what is it that you look for in, when you evaluate an investment as an investor? Uh, so then you're going to have uh, lots of different aspects in that investment criteria that you look for. You're going to look for about the market. You're going to look at the traction of the company, the performance and the team and so forth. So the more that you can find data sources that are correlated with those dimensions before, the better you can do the automated screening, mm. right? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So why is no one doing that? And that's the point, right? That's the no, point. You, you, when you looked out, this is a whole, no one has started to do this data driven. No. Um, and we, uh, the data is just out there waiting for this to happen. And it's just about to uh, apply this data driven mindset to it, to investing. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is. Uh, and then um, uh, we, uh, of course, then should use, um, as soon as you've started to collect data, then you should, of course, use all the, the, the tools that you have in the modern data toolbox, which includes everything to machine learning as well. Yeah. Just use whatever you have to, to try to answer the questions in the best possible way. Uh, so that part, it's not rocket science, it's just out and do it, right? Uh, and then, um, of course, that make, meets, uh, means that uh, you will be able to, to uh, prioritize which companies you should not miss out on and you should um, look for. Um, and you can predict uh, with some kind of degree that uh, this com these batch of companies would probably be, have a higher chance of succeeding later on versus these ones. You could see but that it, in the uh, data. And it's about being then understanding what are the right questions to ask. <coughs> uh, you know, are you spotting companies or are you spotting trends? You know, are you sp you know all this kind of stuff yes. really boils down to the hardcore mechanics of being a, an expert venture yeah. capitalist yes. but then 
translating that into data points. Yeah, exactly, really. and, and algorithms. And algorithms. So that is the total quest all the time. Uh, so it starts with figuring out, try to deconstruct the investment decision. What yeah. do we look for? Exactly. Uh, so and what makes us good? Uh, is it trend that makes us good, yeah. or is it uh, that I can spot this Exactly. Company. And then what are we really spotting? And then try to to um, uh, put that into to some kind of mechanics. So mm. how can we? Okay, you talk about trends. Okay, so how can we quantify trends? Mm. Let's build some algorithms ah, to figure out exactly. trends. Exactly. Is this a, is this a valid trend? Or yeah. Uh, or and, and then try to find uh, what are the metadata about trends that you want to find, <sighs> right? And then qu quantify yeah. that. Unpack, so it's, it's unpack, unpack, unpack your unpack. brains all the time. Yeah. But and, and that works to some extent, right? You do all the things that uh, humans can do, but then you also start to figure out that, wait, well, a lot of the stuff that you say you do, you're not really doing, right? And it's no. not really what you're saying is that it's really correlated with later stuff. You start to see that, wait, wait, a lot of these decisions are, and then you come to, you know, emotion-driven. Bias. Bias. Not but, so, but is there some stuff that at least the current type of tech that we have in machine learning is not able to do and that humans are still better at when it comes to trying to do sourcing? Um, yeah, yes and no, but I think it's probably a matter of time. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, um, so, for example, the, we always said that team, the team questions, understanding teams is, is super key, right? right? Uh, and uh, the, the composition of the team of your investment. Yeah, that or exact, or what is it that you say when you say team? That's a good question, right? Mm -hmm. What is it that you really mean when you say that uh, we uh, you want to look at the team? Is, does it mean you know what does it mean? It's a mix of what they've done before, the track record, track right? Record. Yeah. But also the the just. Um, um, Emotional connection, maybe, but how important is that actually when you start to quantify it? Yeah. Uh, so decomposing all of that and then thinking about um, there is a lot of team information out there. Uh, and we started to explore that quite heavily and see that, well, actually, if you can start to combine data about what um, companies have done in the past, uh, what investments they have done, with the teams that were in place at that time. You could, you, and then you s get that information about teams into the future too. So say like, okay, well, here is a new startup. It's started by uh, these three founders. And one of them was actually part of this one. Spotify when, when Spotify was growing in that mm. period uh, and attracted great investors at that time. Mm. So doing those relationships links is impossible for a human to do. Uh, right. and, uh, but it's, it's very easy to do for, for And that well. perhaps I think highlights some of the more un unattractive things about you know, building a startup, that it's not sufficient to have the best tech or the best idea even sometimes. No. You, know, you have to have the right connections perhaps as well. And right or how would you agree with that? Or? That that's uh, how it has been, right? And that's one of the things we wanted to disrupt, uh, okay. uh, because the way that investors find founders is a lot driven by connections. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. that creates a lot of bad uh, bad things, uh, bad in, bad investment decisions, but also lack of access for lots of founders. Yeah. Because they don't, uh, they don't have those networks. They're not used to talk no. to talk investor language. They don't have the, the data. They, they have to trust to whatever they have. And, yeah. and what they do have is the connections, and that's the only thing they can trust. Unle unless they have the proper data, yeah, um, that's what they have to resort to. I guess. And also, since uh, investors are humans, uh, we would also uh, start. To tr you always try to identify patterns, mm. and uh, then the brain works is biased, right? So mm. if you feel that. Um, uh, here is another lead from a great person that give, given me leads before that led me to great right. investments. Yeah. If I get a new lead from this person, it must be better. Perfect. <laughs> I just I don't even have to check. You know, last time was fantastic. Let's do it again. That's super hard, right, for a new founder that did not have that connection from before. So yeah. it's it's uh, you get yourself so biased into this, and then linked to this, like you start to yeah, you need to look at the data, and then you always try to see only to see the data that supports again your your biased uh, uh, view from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the problem which we wanted to fix. Uh, where if you instead look at the uh, the objective data, look at the traction of the, the company, how fast is it growing, we, and we, we compare that to what other growth rates has been in the past for later successful companies, what does it tell us, and then try to uh, pr uh, get the invest investors to first prioritize those kind of companies first before they just jump on everything that's being sent to them. Mm. But that's a hard thing. 
It's really, but, really hard. But, but let me take a, a ch- challenger position just for fun in yeah. this discussion. Like, because someone can argue, like, you know what? Th- this is an artistry. It, it's so many com- dimensions in mm. order to pick one. So, you know, you know, you're kidding yourself. There's no objective path to this. This is really artistry and, mm-hmm. and, and ins- instinct yep. and, and that we almost as humans, someone has the instinct, yep. but can you decompose it? No. So that would be an argument like, you know, if I take that position now, you know, of course you have, you have a vision, it should work, but yep. you, you, you must have gone down a lot of n- bad rabbit holes. Oh way. yes. Oh yes. So I mean like, because <laughs> hypo- I love the hypothesis, yep. but is will it fly you know or did yeah. you have, ever doubt yourself on these topics of course <laughs> a lot of doubt uh but um uh it's an art uh you could say but let's quantify it yeah. oh. right so when is it is it really an art and how can we answer that question well maybe if we start to uh let's try some different dimensions what if we try to say that um of all extremely early stage investments where there is just an idea there is nothing no data at all about the company, mm. then it's probably more an arts, probably. Instinct about... Instinct. Maybe you could get information about what the team has done before. Mm. Uh, but there is m- no more data. But, uh, but there is something that makes you think, I'm, I, I believe in this person. Yeah, and uh, exactly. of course, there are neurons happening in my brain why I believe you, yeah, right? Exactly. And then there is also like uh, the, uh, the business idea. Uh, you could start to look into the, uh, the trends, fit, the trends and, and yeah. you can do like, okay, they're starting on something in this trend that combines these different factors that we have proof points on that this is the next, it shows early signs of this is the next thing, right? So, so when you start but unpacking it, I, I see what you're going. Yeah, that actually because the other parts. Peel the onion. You're saying what is art? Until you peel the onion, but if I think kung fu is art. Until you peel the onion on what, yeah. what it's Bruce Lee actually doing. But it's such a, a common uh, counter argument. You know, uh, this is this is art, or I know this, right? Uh, and I, uh, that's great. Sales is art. But let's I know tr- let's try to to unpack it. Maybe yeah. it's not everything is is completely uh, impossible. Let's quantify how much is art. So mm. of, if we instead focus on some companies where they have come further, where there is data. You can quantify to say, okay, well, companies that have looked like this, this trajectory, this uh, composition of team, uh, what's the probability of them succeeding? And you can quantify that, right? So it's not art. Well, it's art within a much more narrow uh, probability slice. Uh, but what you did now, I think, is a super important for everybody, you know, trying to convince their board to go more data driven, mm-hmm. right? Also, oh, and someone says, oh, sales is art. You cannot analyze sales. But you know what, maybe we can look at the end-to-end sales process and we can unpack that and then we can let the artful sales guys do what they do best. I'm sure there are things that can help them to sell more. I mean, yes. like, so, so what you're doing when you're, when you're peeling the onion, maybe something is art. I'm not saying no, but no. what is not exactly. art? And exactly. let's focus on that. This and is a very good rhetoric. By and, and then uh, once you have identified those things, yeah. let's make sure we find other opportunities that match that. Right, other uh, sales uh, leads or companies, and then bring them in, and let then we have more companies to do our art on. Yes, right. Mm-hmm. So it's it's it, it's a little bit like you because you get into that. I, I, I must uh, t- tell a story. I was at Vattenfall, and uh, this is uh, you know, big big uh, assets, and we were pushing for predicted maintenance in heat plants. In, in this is in Germany, and this is th- this is a real argument. Uh, I don't need predictive maintenance. Mm. I can just feel it when it's vibrating the wrong way. Yeah. Fuck off. <laughs> this is real. But this is how this it is. happened, right? Yes. And and I was too young to have your argument. Yeah. I, I didn't know how to respond to that. No. I was just, I'm going to fuck off. I'm not going to work with this no. idiot. But that's real. Yeah, it's real. It, it, it no, happened. It's everywhere. It's happened. And if you would go back to these politicians that we started with, yeah, same. they say I, the same. Oh, same. You know? oh I can oh. feel the market. Yeah. But isn't that funny, right? It oh, is, it's all uh, vibrations. It's the story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, but to some degree, this is interesting, right? Uh, sorry for rabbit holes, Hanesh. Yeah, you, I'm uh, used to it. It's you're fine. used to it. <laughs> Actually, I think you missed it because I was in quarantine last time, and and so, you know when I we missed the rabbit holes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's like sometimes like, oh, Henrik, you fucked up my whole argument. I was going down this way, and you took it this way, yeah. and then when and then uh, when I wasn't there, oh. You miss me. You miss yes. me a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, the joke is, the rabbit hole. I, 
I think it's so much learning in what we're talking about now. So, so I'm, I'm trying a little bit to take the dumb oh, guy's uh, argument to reflect on what the hell did you say now? Because yeah. I think there was some profound stuff. When you come into EQT, in, in, in essence, what, we are, what you're doing now, you're going into an, an industry that is not traditionally so data driven. Mm. And Jalmar is super smart and identifies that this is the new trend. So he recruits someone who has the right thinking to help him unpack this yes. because Jalmar himself can't do this. No. But he, he knows he enough. Knows so he, enough. He, he, he did the dibs. Yeah. He did the dibs. And he got the right guy in to help him unpack. Now, I think this is profound in how big corporates need to think if they want to be data-driven. Yeah. And they, they need to do what Jalma did, essentially, or what uh, uh, Mr. Ek did. Yes, <laughs> totally. Well, did you, it's that simple, No, right? that's, that's, uh, that's totally right. I, I just wanted to confirm that. Yes. I, I think this is huge yeah. in terms of it's simplicity. Uh, simplic if you really want to solve it, uh, it's no other way. It's, no. It's, it's, oh, the, it's the most direct route, I would argue. The, the other, if I can add one more thing to it, it's the... the uh, <laughs> <laughs> to your rabbit hole. To my rabbit hole, <laughs> sorry. Uh, is the, uh, the importance of getting it into the, the, pr the work process. Mm. Because you can do... Um, you can do uh, like uh, unpack this and do a lot of an analysis, right? And come up with conclusions that look, this is how we should do it. Look at this. This is uh, this is not art. This is we can really quantify this and blah blah blah. But uh, and you can get a lot of nodding heads, right? And then they go back and do your work, and that's like we've always done it. Oh, this is so good. Uh, but how do you change that? Uh, yeah, that's how, hard. How do you change the actual? So then you, you have to at least this is what I uh, learned in the mothering project. You have to build. Or you need to make sure that the, the tool that the people use in their day-to-day -day life is affected. So you need to get, get the, the, the data, the AI, the algorithms into the, the things that actually um, uh, the team use to do their everyday work. I think this is profound number two, because we have all these BI tools over on the, on the side yes. here, but I'm, I'm doing my sales job yes. over here. Exactly. That's not really going to fly. Is That's that not going to fly. That's never going to fly. Yeah. So, because who, uh, who sits and do their work here uh, and their day-to-day -day work that, um, uh, where you manage, you know, what is important for you. And then someone tells you, oh, you should also go and see in this other system to find some stuff that is cool. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, that sounds amazing. And then I go back and do my work here. You're never going to change their minds. You need to minds. indoctrinate the insight hardcore back in. And now this is the full circle back into, we can't just have BI and analytics on the side. We need to operationalize it. You know, so all the way back to even if it's not for Spotify's operationalizing, it's for the end customer. Mm. But you need to think the same thing way, operationalizing AI or analytics, even if it's internal insights yes. and decisions. Yes. Th that's the bottom line. Yeah, so the, the tools that the, your teams use for their day-to-day -day job, that's where you need to make sure that, the, that the whatever, whatever you learn from your data and, and AI work has to go in and affect the way you work. I love this, sorry. No, now you go. Now Rabbit hole done. I, would, oh, I don't believe you, but let's hope so. <laughs> We're like one, one hour and 20 minutes into, and we haven't, you know, come to, to the real meat of the discussion. Let's yet. go there now. <laughs> but then thinking about it, you have expertise in how to run companies, you know, from McKinsey, about making them data-driven from Spotify, how to get funding from, uh, with, you know, EQT. And now you're starting your own company. Yeah. How did that happen uh, yeah. and what you're going to do? What am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> so please tell us, you know, um, what, what's up? It's <coughs> called Arc Capital, right? Yes, hmm? exactly. Um, funny that you asked about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> One and a half hour thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Uh, no, I think um, uh, this is, um, I mentioned that I love starting things and building mm. things. And I think, again, after five years uh, at EQT, I felt that uh, now this uh, really works. Uh, we have uh, two funds in EQT Ventures 1 and 2 running. Uh, I was also part of uh, setting up this uh, uh, the growth fund as well. And yeah. the whole Mother Brain team was uh, not just like started as an idea. We started to build it. And then we had 25 people. So it became like a big startup of its own within you can see. So that's like the ship is sailing. This is really fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have great teams that work on that. Yeah. 
Uh, and that uh, got me, you know, started thinking, uh, or like my nerves were starting to itch again for starting a new thing again. Yes. Uh, and at the same time, also seeing all these great founders that I met during my years as an investor, uh, pitching all the time every week by tens of, of founders, uh, and then seeing how my judgments were like sometimes correct and sometimes not correct. And also trying to work with these companies to like uh, being um, uh, help them to with different things. And sometimes I was just frustrated. Why don't they do what I tell them? I, I see what I, how this should be done. Yeah. And uh, uh, and sometimes I feel like I, it's probably not that easy when you when you get there yourself. So I just wanted to start something myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so then I had uh, several ideas during my years of things. If I start something, what should I do? And one of these things was uh, uh, what came out from a um, frustration and observation of these different uh, great founders that I met with. So many founders are building great companies, uh, but they don't fit perfectly well for the VC mandate. Uh, so the VCs can, we can only, as a VCs, we can only invest in, uh, in, uh, in companies, if we see that here is an upside that could really be like 100x of the investment, mm-hmm. because we know that uh, we have to make 100 such investments and one or two or three of them will really right. work and the rest will not work. Yeah. So, so the upside of those, every single case has to be like mega. Yeah. Um, so lots of the founders that we met with, they, they, uh, we couldn't invest even though they had great companies. They, when you look at the data, when you do your analysis, when you look at the numbers, you saw that this is a great idea. We already see that the metrics are, are great, but we can't invest as a VC fund. And I walked away. So you expect it, you have to have some kind of 100x It's scaling. a lot of checklist stuff that you need to check uh, uh, such yeah. as that. So the upside needs to be huge. And uh, uh, maybe uh, for many of these founders, like it didn't really match that. They didn't want to build, like take that much risk uh, and uh, go crazy about that or the the target segment was not big enough or it was required a lot of capital that we couldn't uh, go as a VC fund so many many companies out there build great companies great ideas um, uh, but we can't invest as VCs yeah. and these companies cannot go to uh, banks either unless they have been you know successfully profitable uh, for many years uh, because that's what banks are uh, are for. So there's a big gap here with great innovators and founders are building great solutions to world problems that we cannot fund. So who should fund these companies? To identify a gap here. That we yeah, have. A, a large gap. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so I felt like I wanted to start a company that could actually fund these companies. So right. another part uh, of it uh, is also that uh, in many of these companies who are doing great, uh, when you do the analysis, it makes a lot of sense that this is like perfect. When you do the analysis in the way you should do, like using the modern analytics approach, you can see that this is forecastable, this is predictable. Uh, and then in those cases, it feels also a bit bad that why do you need to go to uh, a VC and give away 20% of your company mm. uh, when it's all predictable? This is going to happen. Right. In some way, like using modern tech it's not high risk anymore, then you should not go to a risk investor, right? It's actually low risk. You should be able to go to a bank, but the banks don't understand that they can't do that tech analysis. So that's the other part. So uh, when there is, I think um, from my perspective, having been in this analytics space for long, uh, for me, it was like in many, many cases, this is not high risk. You just do the analytics. You see, this is, this is perfect. This is great. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, where VC money should go to where it's real true high risk mm-hmm. and where there is no, uh, where there is predictable growth, they should be able to go to a bank and just lend money instead. Mm-hmm. So that was the other aspect. Um, so I wanted to start a company that, so what if we do a company that actually connects to the company's own data, do the analy- analytics in the way that we know uh, that the best companies that are best at analytics do you know, the analysis. Uh, and then from that position, after knowing the companies in the best possible way, offer the best possible funding. Uh, that's what I wanted to start. Mm. Uh, but if I wanted to do that, then uh, I knew the data side. I was pretty, I'm pretty experienced in how to run, uh, uh, how to build out the analytics sides, right? And mm. Uh, but I did not know anything about uh, the finance part. So how can we start a company that is a financial institution that lends money to someone? So I need to find other co-founders for that. Uh, so it's very meta, like a funding a funding company. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's also like a big impact, right? If you do that re- well, you can have a really, really big impact. Uh, so that's um, that's what actually drove me the most, I think. So mm. this idea was like, wow, this if I do this well, we could I could fix like funding for 
many founders out there um, have them uh, let them grow much faster and in much more fair ways uh, yeah. and without giving away without giving away like, because I don't think that's really fair in those cases where the, the growth is predictable mm. uh, and then uh, we can serve as a complement to the VCs so the VCs could focus on the high risk stuff and really open and like fund really um, high risky bets and then uh, for the rest the other parts of the business which is predictable they could come to us mm -hmm. um, yeah, that sounds like an awesome opportunity for sure so you started that with some other funders as well yeah so uh, Oliver and Axel yeah and you are the, uh, the three main people right now, right? Uh, no, we, so we are the three co-founders, uh, yeah. and uh, they started the company uh, earlier last year, yeah. and I joined full time in September. Okay, cool. And since then, we have uh, been recruiting as well and mm. uh, done a lot of fundraising as well. Oh, awesome. Can you just mention a bit? You know, how are you going to go about this? Uh, I mean, for for a VC at least, you know, it's like five plus a year before you get any kind of return. From, from the investments you're doing, mm -hmm. how are you going to make that work? Um, uh, so the, uh, the nice thing here is that we don't have uh, the requirements that we have to have 100x return right. uh, on our investments. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, what we need is that we need to have um, uh, the companies being able to, to grow into a situation where they can repay our loan. Mm -hmm. So it's a much lower, a much lower uh, barrier for them to, or it lowers the scope or the definition of what, which companies that are in scope for us, which means that we can lend money to lots of companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, so do you offer loans with interest instead of a stake in a company? Or? Exactly. So that's oh, how it do. works. Oh. So what we need, when we do the analytics, we set it up uh, and the best possible way you can get a really good view of where this company is heading. And we need to establish, do we believe that this company can, uh, is, is going to be able to repay the loan to us? Right. That's it for us. Right. Oh, so it's not, uh, it's not the analysis as a VC has to do, which is, do we believe that this company can return our whole fund? Like, uh, it's a data-driven bank, right? It's a data-driven bank. It's a data-driven <laughs> bank, but that, that is working with completely different metrics yes. that the old bank has a problem with dealing with exactly. in their but business, in their regular, in their but policy. But it's, it's still, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the way a bank was formed in the past was using all the data available at that time. And we, we do that now, right? So it's, a, it's just an, a genera like an evolution of the bank. Mm -hmm. If you create a bank and in 2022, of course, it, ha it should look at all the data. Yeah, yeah, of course. Right. So you can argue that th this huge gap is because the incumbents haven't really paid attention no. to the data. Exactly. Another industry that needs to be uh, transformed. Okay, so uh, I'm going to ask a question. You probably are not going to answer it, but uh, I'm going to ask it anyway. But okay, so how does your algorithm? How look does like? it work? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the the link to our Git. <laughs> yes, yes, good. Open source the the whole you know the whole thing. Yeah. yeah, maybe in the future. Uh, no, but it's uh, it's uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we're building it right now, right? So mm. we we're we're in the the seed stage of the company. Uh, and uh, but but basically we connect to um, uh, the company's uh, uh, platform. So every company that you start these days, you, if you have marketing, you, uh, you're connected to uh, Facebook or Instagram or Google where you run your ads, uh, and then you may get some revenues from if you have an app, you have revenues from Google from uh, app stores at Google or, or yeah. uh, iOS. Uh, and then uh, if you have a product, you might also have like uh, engagement data of your product, so clicks and stuff. And then you would maybe use Mixpanel or whatever you have, if you have that. So uh, if you're building your company, a tech company today, you have this, uh, you're using these kind of platforms. And if you're good with data, you're also connecting to these platforms yourself, and then you build your own analytics team and, and, uh, and build out your data-driven culture. Mm -hmm. Most companies don't get there. Uh, most companies will get there l like years in maybe. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, even from your day one, you have access to, you actually in theory have access to the data from these platforms because there is APIs. Mm. So when you come to us, we connect to these platforms. Mm. So we get, a, we get this data immediately and then help you to show uh, immediately how the analysis looks like. So this mm. is immediately So you're, you're accelerating the uh, insight maturity of these companies as well. Yes. So, so not a, so. This is the big two whammy value: money, yes, but I, because we need to do the analysis to give you money, I give you this analysis so we you can understand Which is what. It's probably doing. pretty helpful for you as well. Yeah, and you and you can even advise and like loan with us, and we can give you pointers on where to go. Exactly. 
which is part of the storytelling, right? Yes. And what type of company <laughs> should come to you? I mean, they, they can't be... That was my question. Fuck yeah. it. <laughs> I love it. Take it. <laughs> I mean, it, I guess it can't be a company that has not yet connected to any kind of customer. They need to have some kind of growth. And exactly. Some, right? So we're not in this art uh, stage, right? Mm. There has to be data. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we say, I mean, the whole thesis is that if you're growing and there is data uh, and uh, when we um, enough so that we, when we apply the latest analytics thinking to this, we can find mm. predictable growth. Yeah. And that requires that there is some data, but mm. much less data than if you go, we go to a bank mm. or anyone else, because we we have the uh, the tools to do this analysis better than anyone else. Mm-hmm. But but I was so intrigued with this. So like, oh, this is maybe not something for Daredex, but th- one of the key ingredients here doesn't it need to be some sort of digital company that is sort of using or selling a product, having an app, or in some ways having a digital footprint that you can analyze. If it or, or or can you can you branch out in other types of data? Um, well, you have to have uh, you have to be connected to tech platforms. Yes, so we mm-hmm. can get some data to it. But I think most companies these days are tech companies. They're using tech to drive their growth. So mm-hmm. they have uh, marketing through tech platforms. They mm-hmm. have uh, uh, invoices coming in through some cloud platform or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so as so that's what that's what's my, like because you have the financial platforms like Fort Knox. Yep. This is one data point. And then you have, of course, your Google Ads, if you, if you do that. Yep. And then you have, you know, yeah. So there are more than just the Google Ads and, and if you're in yeah. social media and Facebook. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that's what I mean. Every company has a, ha- has a tech um, platform today that they use to run their company. And we, then we can connect to it. Uh, but what makes it really uh, even better is, of course, if, you, if that's part of your growth. So if you use... Uh, the modern digital uh, channels uh, to grow your company, then it's even more upside to it. So, and, so and I have to guess. connect to Tesla as well. We have to m- mention Elon Musk at least once, you know, yeah. in every podcast, I think. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, th- they also have like... We do it uh, because we want him on the show, but uh, <laughs> maybe that works. I don't know. <laughs> but you also have, you know, the Tesla insurance that is also based on your performance in mm-hmm. some way. If you drive in a safe way, you have a lower insurance rate, basically. Yep. Would you do the same, that the loan and the rate uh, that you can provide for that would be based on the risk that you can predict? Uh, yes, definitely. So if, if, uh, if the data is more predictable based on, um, yeah, based on the data we can see, then uh, we, will, we would be able to offer you better terms. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Do you provide advice as well? So if you if you do the kind of calculation and you see, you know, oh, it's not really a, very predictable or very stable, can you give them some advice as well into in how to decrease that? Or, or yeah, uh, that uh, f- for sure. With the tool, uh, with the dashboards and the insights from that, definitely there is going to be API access and things like that as well on the technical side. Uh, and then, uh, but then the more general advice, um, uh, we, we're not building the company to do like uh, consultancy from ourselves back to, uh, back to customers. But obviously I think if this grows out to be a big company, then mm. that could be something to, to add on probably with someone else. But we focus on building the scalable core of, uh, uh, of building this finance platform. Mm. Awesome. And, and you do collect the data. You mentioned a number of, uh, sources that you can find the data from, and, and what is the? Can you, if you go a bit techy, I know you, you don't want to disclose all the details, but just you know, you can mention or you can think about different objectives that you want to predict in some way. It mm-hmm. could be like I want a one-year return, or it could be you know, I don't know, whatever kind of growth that you want to predict. Mm-hmm. Can, can you mention something? That what really are, are your thinking there in, in finding, you know, how can you use the data to do some kind of prediction? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, inspired by, um, if I just think about all the companies that I have worked with that uh, have uh, uh, that have succeeded really well in, in working with data to become better, uh, mm. f- grow faster or make better decisions. The ones that are doing it really well, they do some different things uh, really well. And we take those pieces and build that into our platform. Mm. So then we get better decisions ourselves and we also get a better tool out. So immediately our customers will get access to you know, the best in class uh, analytics insights and that will continue to evolve. 
Amazing but, how uh, you said that without giving any details at all. But I can give you one example. <laughs> I was just a, a, a was so context. Sly. It was so smooth. So smooth. <laughs> Politician, you know. Yes. But uh, media uh, trained. Media trained. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, one such example, I think, is uh, uh, the concept of unit economics, where you want to understand lifetime value versus yes. the cost of uh, bringing in a user. That was something we were early on in, in, uh, with at Spotify. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you uh, if you think about that and do that model really well, that can really make make your company much faster because mm. uh, the quicker you can understand how your LTV CAC uh, ratio looks like mm. on the macro level, the better you will become at uh, uh, spending your your money at the things that work. And and, uh, and for the normal people, LTV CAC. You have to become more technical, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. This is the. It's always I'm, I'm the stupid guy <laughs> position, and he's the smart guy position, and I'm I'm dumbing it down. Right. So yeah. So LTV lifetime value. So, yeah. so LTV. If you if yeah. CAC is a customer acquisition cost. So yeah. At the fundamental level, you spend money uh, in some way to get customers to your company, right? And then that's a cost per customer, and yeah. then you want the, those customers to. Uh, to stay on to your whatever product, or, uh, whatever it is, and then to bring in money back. So it's a combined ratio, LTV, CAC. Yeah, so the, the, the value you get from your users should be more than what you pay for them. Otherwise, you're, you're, <laughs> you're going down the drain. Yeah. Um, lifetime value can be something uh, two or five years ahead or something that you try to calculate what the average value for each customer will be in some future time right? exactly so then uh, uh, then that becomes your judgment here so how much what is our requirement right now that how much money should we get in uh, or should we um, if we spend ten dollars for, for to bring in one new user uh, or customer when do we need to get that money back yes. for some it's like oh it's early we don't care about that it could be paid back in 10 years and for others it's like oh, we need to get them back instantly on their first purchase mm. yeah. Because then, uh, and uh, that's different for different business models and stages, but still, uh, that equation is very important. If you get that, that right, you can empower your teams to really iterate on your product, to, to on your retention, on your pricing, and and uh, the better you are at predicting that, uh, then the better you will become as a customer uh, or as a company. You grow faster, and the better um, financing decision we will make as well. But I w and I would argue that we have great tech inventors and startups that don't has the same deep grip on the ratios and the KPIs as you have done it when you've been drilled it in, in this in AKT exactly. and you grew up with it in Spotify. Yeah. And maybe so, some of those core ratios, and it, you know, it really drives your focus in a completely different way than if you use mm -hmm. Go. So this is the nice thing, right? Uh, uh, that's exactly right. I mean, we were spending five years like exploring and inventing this way of working at Spotify. And five years into EQT, I've been working with 100 portfolio companies iterating on this, like figuring out how this should be done. You've been building this business model for a while. Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, so what if we, uh, or then I've been thinking like, but this should be common, common knowledge for everyone, it's right? It's not. It's not. So what if, why don't we build this into this platform and offer it to our customers as well? And that will help them early on to to bec to get this to them without them having to spend years, uh, and that also helps us. Right? Super, super cool. And okay. uh, yeah, so yep. that's in this field. As uh, to close this example, is uh, uh, if you you can use all your data to build those models much more accurate. So if you invest time in tech, uh, in machine learning, you can build the, uh, these models become really really accurate with very little data, and that's a really power if you if you do this really well. Yep. I have so a. Yeah. Uh, do you want to take it first? Yeah, okay, because I, I, I'm, it, it's 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 bolts on to the angle of trying to unpack uh, how you do things, mm -hmm. but maybe do it a little bit more politically correct. <laughs> Not asking for the 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 algorithm, but when you started this journey now with your experiences, what what has been your strategy or thinking around your tech stack and your architecture? What, where did you start off? You know, what what is your core technology you started with, and and how you think it's going to evolve? A little bit like, is it cloud, of course, I guess. Are you building it all from scratch? Are you sort of open sourcing stuff? Are you right. make or buy decisions in here? Yeah, that's, um, um, I think the, uh, it's super nice to start things from scratch now because then we can make all these choices in, the, in this uh, paradigm where there is so much stuff available. Mm. When we, uh, back in our Spotify days, nothing was available. Mm. Every tool out there was just built for the old world, right? Where there was little data. 
so we had to build everything ourselves uh, at Spotify. Uh, but now we can use uh, we can use the modern data stack, which is which helps us to be really fast to one of one of three big clouds uh, as a base. One of the three, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, you, of course you have the cloud as your base, and then. Uh, you can structure your uh, analytics in in much better way than what we could do before. So building data pipelines is much faster now. It's much easier to become structured uh, in that flow. So we can pick the tools that really helps us here, uh, and uh, also the connectors to all these different platforms out there. The if we yeah. if we started this company five years ago, three years ago, we we had to build everything ourselves. Now we don't. We can use companies that do offer these connectors as a business model. And you can that. integral map. You can go to anyone who can even be an API guy yeah. for you. So we can focus on really the what is unique to us, which is the this analysis, right? The the models, the algorithms, the the machine learning parts of actually doing that prediction parts really, really well. Everything else we we could just pick and choose and um, and make sure we fit them all together. So we become really fast in, in getting to a, a product that is actually. But valuable. maybe a little bit stupid question. So so it consists of data pipeline, microservices, APIs, and then uh, user interface to deal with your workflow for you as in your operating. Your, your your workspaces, so to speak, for 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 the company, so to speak. Yeah, it's I mean it's it's uh, connecting to well, it's connectors to our customers' platforms. Yeah, to this gather is API data. stuff. Yeah. yeah, and then it's a uh, transformation of that data yeah. uh, to to fit with our data uh, our data models. Yeah, and then so it's the whole data modeling parts, yeah. big parts, and then out from that that is uh, the outputs to the the consumers of of this of the which insight. is insight visualizations type. yes which is uh, uh, served through a, uh, as easy to to um, grasp act it. on uh, ui for our people that will offer financing and our customers. So, so did you build them a web interface with a UI where you can look at your data? Yes, I mean, building a web UI with graphs, it's, it's easy, right? Yeah. It's nothing. So, I mean, I before, say. if we started this uh, years ago, we would have you to use any of the like dashboarding companies to use, but yeah. it's just super easy, right, to build graphs. But what is not easy is to think about the design and UX to make this Easy to grasp and like you know as In, a insight popping. Huh? I'm glad you said the word pop because I'm coming back to my McKinsey life. Like how to create the story? Like the your conclusion has to stand out, right? Mm -hmm. What and that links to uh, make it really simple, right? What is the metric to pick? So it, like from all the, the millions of rows of data and the, the advanced analytics, it should be extremely simple. So advanced and simple is my principle. <laughs> That's lovely. Very obvious. Advanced and simple at the same time. Yeah, That's exactly. the answer. Dare to be advanced <laughs> and simple. That's a new t-shirt. <laughs> okay, so we only have like 20 minutes-ish le left, but I'd like to, to move a bit more into more... We haven't even touched the professional topics and, and we have the societal stuff. But if we just continue a bit on... I can uh, come back. You this might is so good. Year, this is, uh, Henrik, this is so fantastic. And I, I think we've said it's some fun. profound stuff and it's so fun. But if we just continue I a bit mind. on what we just said and, and think a bit more generally, but we can connect it to our capital, mm -hmm. I think. And imagine someone listening to this and, and they're thinking, that sounds like an awesome idea. I want to have some financing and a loan from our capital. What would be your best advice to <coughs> say, you know, this is the way, if they come to, to you and, and make a pitch, mm -hmm. what should they really do and not to do to, to make you pick them and choose them? Well, that's the nice thing. You don't have to pitch much, right? You just uh, come to us and say that we have a great company and like, I'll, I'll, uh, sh um, I'll let you connect to our data and, and then you'll see it. That's actually a very surprisingly good answer, I would say, <laughs> <But> <laughs> which is almost disappointing. I, for me, it's a bad <laughs> answer because if my, my business model is not fitting into, I mean, like, for some companies, it's very simple, right? Yeah. Let, let show us your data and we can see it, boom. But then you will have companies like, ah, you have a business model which is consulting and services, yeah. you work in this way. So, you, so your model will not be for everyone, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or, or are you, I, I argue that you could probably stretch it more and more. Yeah, it's finding, kind of, it finding data it points in different ways. Eventually, we will uh, stretch it to all the different business models, but we need to start somewhere, right? We, yeah. we have only a few people right now. So we, we start with the, uh, with like um, SaaS companies, uh, B2C or B2B. Yeah, so SaaS but companies, B2B, B2C, so you can have a data 
digital entry so, point. But it's just because we want to start yeah. with, because you need to start somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you can't do everything at exactly uh, the same time. full sense. So you start to build out the models for a segment. and the, that uh, I need to connect you to some people. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. <laughs> Okay, so if there is a company that have some kind of a s uh, software as a service kind of solution that can scale, I guess that's mm. what you're looking for in this yes. case, because it's a safe bet, you know, from a scaling point of view. Exactly. That's something that they can do. But still, if we take it one more step, you are going to connect to the different data sources you have, yep. and you get some kind of initial metrics. But if someone were to do that kind of investigations themselves before they come to you, what should they look for? What is it that they should try to optimize for in the before data they come to us? Before they come to you. Well, um, I mean, ideally, they would be have insights into their data, and they okay. could say they know that uh, we are we have uh, we have proven that we can grow, and, and uh, we we if we could get um, a loan here, we could grow faster. If they mm -hmm. know that, if they have proven that, that's a great point. But the loan actually do provide value in some way. They would want. Uh, we want them to. Um, we want to provide capital for them to grow further. Yes. And if they if feel that I know that I uh, have proven uh, that I uh, have grown grown to where I am today, and if I can get more money, I will get grow even faster. Mm. If they know that themselves, then you know most likely we're going to see that in data too. Then mm. it's going to be nice. Mm. Uh, but um, how important is it that they have a clear idea what they need the money for in, in their scaling journey? Because it's a little bit this story. So John Bosch said, like, well, you can kill a company by giving them too much money too early. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not go through the nailing f stage. They need to go to the st scaling phase because then they know what they need. Yeah. So, I mean, what we, what we are doing when we connect to the data is, is really to see how are they using money today and uh, what is driving their growth today. And then you would see that, okay, well, maybe it's not the money that is driving the growth, maybe something else. So giving them more money probably won't make it for them. Uh, and then it's going to be a, a conversation. Uh, okay, so what is it that you're going to do? And why do you think you will in the future do, uh, why will money help you in the future if it hasn't helped you in the past? And maybe it could be good reasons for that. So that's, it's not out of scope, but it's, then it will require a discussion here. Uh, but it's a, uh, it's a very interesting topic. And when we have lent money to a company, they will also continue to get access to this uh, to the tool, uh, which will help them to also track very important metrics. So make sure that if they start to like overspend on stuff uh, and it doesn't work, they will see it. And it will, it will help them to act immediately, right? Yeah, very good. So they, it's because it's good for us and good for them, right? So we so have we this aligned uh, incentives. So that we want them to succeed. And that comes back to the, to the tool. We, we, I don't want to build like a mega uh, dashboarding solution here where they can slice, dice, slice and dice data however, however they want. We want to build um, a tool, a UI for them that make them really grow faster. In a, but but in how do you capture other, you know, hard to capture metric from the data sources you mentioned, like the quality of the team uh, do you ignore that completely or can you uh, capture that somehow or uh, so uh, right now we don't have uh, any any sources for that uh, so that will be but it's not as important as uh, the uh, VC case here because uh, if if the team has proven that they can grow and we see like uh, this is predictable into the future mm -hmm. uh, and we can say that uh, we comfort or with some certainty we believe that they will in the low scenario, even re be able to repay our loans, mm. then it's fine, right? Actually, then we don't care much about who is running this, like and where you come you from, and anything. Exactly. So that can be like a almost like a quality kind of uh, way to to equalize who can get funding. Exactly. And it doesn't have to one be the one that have the, the great exactly. connections. Exactly. Right? That's exactly it. That makes a lot uh, of sense. You, you, you are objectively looking at the hard numbers. Yeah. And then, you, then you're having models to understand uh, the, the scenarios and predictability in the trajectories of those numbers. So it's just maths, right? It's just mm -hmm. statistics. But still, just to, to linger a small part or time longer on, on that, you know, so, so some companies still want to grow their company and they want to set them up to, to become as uh, great, you know, partner with you, if you mm. call it that, as possible, and, and they still want to build their team, and, and you've been part of building teams for a long time as well. H how would you still recommend people to do get that kind of number, the data that is required for this? What type of, 
have you seen any like you know failure with that they require the wrong type of people? I'm thinking about you know what John said you know with salespeople etc. Yeah. And you can actually, I would argue, you can also blow up numbers sometimes with data that looks completely wrong because you simply do that with you know bloated numbers if you know what I mean. Yeah, uh, definitely. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, think about my position. I've been involved in probably around 100 investments uh, mm -hmm. that made it uh, a, for Ikit Ventures. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, to get there, there's been a lot of uh, uh, nays as well, like yeah. uh, much, much more. Uh, so I've seen many, many cases um, uh, like that. But, but let's let me get some more background about this, because we spoke a bit with Jan Bosch as well about this. And, yeah. and, and I think, you know, you know, a lot of people, including myself, think it's super important with engineers and, and mm. that they can have the tech expertise necessary to build the, the product that they can have and scale. And, and he actually also said, and, and of course, I do believe we should have salespeople not saying that. But I think sometimes, you know, people abuse salespeople that they, in, in a way that they can simply push money into marketing and, and that makes the numbers look really great. And there is no real substantial you know, customer value that they do provide. And in that way, you can fool the numbers to look good. What do you mean? Like you're selling stuff that long term, the stickiness is not there, but someone sold it really well. Yeah, I mean, you can just push money into marketing and then the, you know, the number of customers is growing really you know, nicely, but it's not really sustainable growth. So that's exactly what you can see, right? So if you actually look at the data, how the users, if, sure. if you're able to, I mean, what you said is, is uh, great, actually, if... <laughs> As a first step, um, you said that p uh, if you spend money, you can bring in new customers. Yes. Not, not everyone managed to do that. It's a yeah. lot of companies that spend a lot of money. And when you look at what happened when they started to increase their spend, mm. actually, they didn't... There's it not didn't really uptake no, anyway. They just spend more and they don't make the connection that... The conversion is not uh, really it's there. It's not really happening. Mm. Uh, Maybe they have some uh, other metrics that improve, but not the customers. And that, mm. that's a mistake then. Mm. But uh, if you manage to get them in, as you said... Uh, so then you pass like the first great point. But yeah. then the other thing is that what do they do on the platform uh, or your product or your... Do they grow? Do they churn? Do they come back? Uh, yeah. or do, they, do they monetize? Uh, are you able to monetize mm -hmm. them or not? Yeah. Or do you get the wrong... Maybe you got the wrong customers in through your marketing. So they, uh, or your product is not sticky enough or good enough. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the point, right? So if the more data you can get on that, uh, the more you can understand it and predict it. And... Uh, if you also have a platform where you can capture usage data, you, usually that engagement data is extremely helpful in predicting the future, uh, future retention of those users mm. as well. So that's exactly what it is. And think about if uh, you build something, uh, you just early on, but you have some kind of traction, you haven't at all spent time on analyzing your data yourself, but you have a hunch that it might work. And then you come to us and we, we apply the latest and greatest in analytics thinking and we can talk to you about how it works right now. Then maybe we, we find out that it's too early right now, but we'll give you the tools to, mm. to say that if you hit these numbers, you, we help you to define what should that be. Mm. Then it's, it's, you know that you're, you're um, then helping your, yourself to grow your company in a healthy way. Mm. And by the way, we could also offer you money. Mm -hmm. um, I have a not personal question, but how are you thinking about bootstrapping VC and, and getting money and investments or you do need it for our capital? How, how are you doing it? Yeah, uh, we, uh, that's uh, that's what I, as a founder, that uh, is exactly what I've been focusing on. <laughs> so uh, we are have been uh, fundraising for ourselves, uh, and uh, um, that's been um, but that's good, good said, traction. Because you said that uh, you know you've been homing in on your pitch on who you are, right? exactly. So you've been, but so you you're going down. The, this is the VC. Yeah, so exactly. For so for, for us, uh, as an investment case, we don't have any performance data yet. No. We just started. So for us, it's an arts decision. Yeah. And you are 100x. Exactly. Yeah. Just look at me. X. <laughs> <laughs> so no, definitely. So for us, it's a high risk uh, investment. That and has, how have you been thinking to, about uh, Swedish, Nordic, European, US, uh, you know, do, and, and it's so interesting because you've been Coming from Spotify, you've been on AQT, you've seen on that side, now you've seen on the other side. And Aurora Bellfrog, uh, I think she, she, fantastic charisma, how she talked about this and, you know, how, you know, behind locked doors, we want to be the preferred choice of the real VC. I mean, like it's, it's this, it's, it's flipping it to a quite hum, humble stage, which I think is super smart yep. to really attract the people who are the real 
thousand X as a as a preferred choice. So now I argue that you are you you know all this. You've been part of that strategizing, yes. and now you sit on the other side yes. of the table. Where it's, are you going? How are you thinking? Extremely interesting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, uh, it was uh, as a VC, I was um, pitching a lot that right uh, that we wanted to be that uh, preferred VC and all the help we would give and everything. And uh, now you need to and make now, that choice. And now I I feel uh, uh, through our own fundraising that I met from the other side of the table. It's extremely interesting to see how all the investors so work. Some are really good. Some are could, part of my friends, but, names, but, not, uh, but without naming names, could you could you could you give us a state of VC a little bit? How you know what you meet? What's the what's the spectrums here? Um, From douchebags to <laughs> the best. <laughs> you said douchebags. This, is a, yeah. this <laughs> is a rabbit hole. This is a rabbit hole. I love I think, it. I, <laughs> I think um, the stage of VCs. There is a lot of VCs out there. It's a, it's a lot of money out there looking for investors. Isn't it also a lot of money right now during due to Corona? I mean, people think sometimes that they are a bit careful right now, but right now it's a really yeah nice uh, time, right? It's. Uh, I mean, we started early on to f- because there was a big hole in the European market for mm. big funds. Since then, there's been much more money coming in, mm. but also a lot more startups. So mm. the startup scene has really boomed. It's been following the, the trend. Uh, so it's a really good environment. Lots of money and lots of... of uh, in, um, and how do you see Sweden you know, placing itself towards other European countries, for example? I mean, in every, mar- in every uh, list, I think Sweden is popping out high. Yeah. Uh, uh, which is great. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, I think that has just uh, continued, which is uh, which is great. And I think it, it comes in waves. So the uh, you know we have Spotify and and and, um, and Skype yeah. Uh, yeah. early on, yeah. bringing the way uh, like uh, the, the wave of people like our, us uh, mm. starting new investors or new startups, and then hopefully we get more, which we do, and then that will give new waves. Yeah. Uh, so I think um, yeah, it's uh, we have we are lucky and fortunate that we were early on in this uh, in the curve. But in without with, without revealing anything, oh, how, how broad are you casting your net in terms of Swedish VC Nordic? Do you mean for my, for yeah. our, the investors for ourselves? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, for that um, we look for um, given we have had high interest, a high a lot of high uh, interest in, in investing in us, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, then we have had the ability to pick and choose a bit, uh, mm-hmm. so we can uh, we uh, we have been able to talk more with some investors that have uh, that can really help us with what we need. So we believe our model is really scalable. I mean, the connectors and data and business models is the same regardless of if you're a B two C startup yeah. in Sweden, Norway, France, or US, or even China, right? Uh, so we want to, to build this out and roll it out into the world, this new way of growing companies as fast as we can. So we want to pick then investors that can help us with that. So trying to find investors that can help us with uh, the best networks out there. Uh, on a global scale. On a global scale. Yeah. Uh, but also we, uh, I think, um, we probably don't have to feel like we need to solve everything from the beginning. So there's going to be stages. Like if we follow the the classic startup track, it's going to be like around now and around later, uh, maybe yeah. two. And then uh, uh, we can start with, we're focusing on Europe now, so we're going to open up. Uh, um, so then you want to, is that, 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 when you focus on Europe, is it preferable to have European VC then? Yeah, exactly. Because we have, we're starting, f- we're focusing on, on Europe, but we're, starting the company here, you know, across mm-hmm. the street in Stockholm. So our natural networks will be more focused here. Yes. So let's take the opportunity if we get more Stage investors one. to pick investors mm-hmm. that have networks in other markets like we do, but other other places, because then we believe that it, that will help us to roll out the fastest we can uh, mm-hmm. when when the time is right. So so what you're saying is you will have a, as the rounds go by and your uh, geo cloning happens, yeah. you will look for investors depending to, on where you To match go. our next stage. Mm. Awesome. And, and let's try. We, we won't really have time to go into any kind of philosophical or societal ah, kind of topics, to but, but we can touch one, I think, okay. and, and connect it Shoot. a bit to what we just spoke about. And, and that is potentially, you know, you're investing in startups. And then uh, some companies we're say that the tech We are not investing. Ah, oh, sorry. Just you're, okay. Okay, lending you're, money to you're lending money financing. to you're Finan- financing. financing. Okay. You're financing startups. Yep. Uh, good. And then some companies are a bit scared about, you know, the 
big acceleration that we see the big tech giants are doing right now and we can easily see if you just look at the most valuable companies in the world that you know the, the top valuable companies in any kind of sector is the tech giants it's the google it's the facebook it's the amazon the microsoft and chinese you know by do Tencent, yeah. Tencent by uh, alibaba whatnot do you think there is a, a risk if you look f- couple of years ahead that the tech giants will continue to accelerate in this way and therefore it will be harder and harder to build startups or do you think the opposite um i think the big tech giants will continue to accelerate but i do not think that's bad for startups i think it's completely the opposite nice because they can make a great exit or in what way no i think they're the big tech giants are uh, continuing to uh, uh, fuel innovation and like r d of things uh, of new tech methodologies but also to create new platforms and new new places to create like new opportunities to build startups upon right Mm -hmm. Uh, so if if, uh, facebook and google didn't exist we couldn't create our company right now because they have thanks to them people use them for marketing market their own companies which generates data which helps us to Mm -hmm. fund them but but do you get sometimes a bit scared of the power that the tech giants have if they will continue to accelerate as well as you say no i love uh, i love that they accelerate because it also it helps um it shows that others can can do the same uh you can create a new global company really fast and and from uh, like take um, a big part uh, affect a lot of people very fast thanks to tech mm. uh, but on the other hand it's scary if you think that they will do that with the wrong uh, intentions right That's so uh, yeah i have to move here now and i mean really i'm on the opposite side i usually take but just because you're saying what you're saying i have to take the opposite side here and, and then okay imagine like facebook yep. or linkedin or twitter uh, or someone gets a huge power and they start to also not only be a tech provider but also take part in the political agenda, for, so, so to speak, yep. and, and start to de-platformize people mm. uh, like Trump <laughs> or other people. Uh, and we, we heard about Joe Rogan, for example, recently at Spotify, which is a big you know, current mm-hmm. discussion that we have. And Spotify is so far taking the stance they're not really uh, censoring or, or they at least do that less than some other tech giants. Do you have any thoughts about this? You know, should tech giants take more of um, responsibility for the content they have, even though it's provided by their users? Or, or what's your thought about this? Uh, I think when you have uh, when you have built big platforms uh, and you uh, have uh, created products that really affects what people do and learn, that affects them, which these platforms have done. Mm-hmm. You can affect that, right? You do control it. I mean, either you do it explicitly or you do it implicitly. Uh, and of course, these big platforms they have a lot of control, and they so they should use that power, I think, to to um, uh, to do the right thing. But then, what is the right thing? Mm. That's uh, that's hard, so and so this is they should they in that way. You mean they should control the content more? Uh, no, I mean they, they they are they're writing their own algorithms on what to prioritize in yeah. their feeds, for example. Yes. Uh, and uh, so, so I mean, explicitly or directly or indirectly, they are controlling what we do, right? Mm-hmm. And what we see and what we don't see. And there's been numerous examples of how that has been problematic uh, with racial content and stuff like that. So I think uh, they should take that opportunity to uh, affect and, and steer the content that they have in a good way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the p- question is, what is what is good here, and, and where where does that line go? And I think actually goes back again to the politician exactly. to the political debate because if if uh, if the debate was <laughs> uh, was on the, one of these platforms, we could say, oh, you're spreading misinformation here. You're, you're actually using facts that fake are not news. Right. Yeah, well, like if if this was happening a debate in television, yeah. we could we could call out fake news. Exactly. We could say like to uh, if it was on uh, Swedish uh, SVT. Uh, national television like uh, oh uh, you're not censoring uh, wrong content here mm. uh, and uh, no they're not because they're not used to this at all uh, and uh, okay. but i think they should it goes back to um, um, they should use the tools that they are that they have and that they're indirectly already using mm. and i think uh, um, coming back to my mother vein days we 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 bet or we'll build this workflow tool which all the users in the team use to prioritize the, the companies we look at. Mm. Uh, and there, uh, uh, we then chose to say, okay, let's 
not just follow all the, the companies that score high up on the probability to succeed, to succeed. Let's make sure to shift it over and make sure that the team over index on companies that have uh, the, a mixed gender split in their right. funding team, for example. Right. So you basically, let's steer the algorithm for good. Let's, let's use the, this, uh, the, the position we have to actually control what people do uh, and to something that we all agree on is something that we want to do but have a hard time doing ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that we, so I think that's a nice way to think about it, and I think that's uh, how people should think about their different feed algorithms and mm -hmm. and content on Spotify. That that they should actually and, apply and, that. And do we want them to do this by good nature, or just this needs to be regulated in order to get there? Yeah. So that's the that is the, the where the where is that line? I think no one has the answer yeah, to it, no. uh, uh, and I think it probably comes, comes back to. Uh, to our brands and what we want to stand for and how we, if, if brands want to help out in society or not, they can take this chance. Because, because there's also this argument that, uh, you know, around your brands and wh why go good AI will be profitable AI uh, is simply that in the end, we as consumers can steer or, you know, can steer them with mm -hmm. our purchasing choices or our platform choices. Yeah. Now, the problem is as when they have monopolistic uh, monopolistic um, almost so basically I have no other choice if I want this type of service I will end up here mm. um, so for me it, it calls for that y I, I'm not so worried about tech giants but in order to push them or in order for me to be able to steer them mm. I also need uh, some alternatives so for me, the scare point is when the alternatives go straight out of the door right because then I don't know then we I can't even with my money, say, I, I'm going to choose your, your friend over here because he's doing the right thing. But then you can still get other reactions such as like now Spotify, people are leaving. Uh, they don't want to be part, like the artists don't want to be part of the platform. Yeah. So they're protesting they, in that perspective yeah. instead. So I think, I mean, uh, we, before we, have, we weren't able to have this discussion, so it's great that we have it. And this is, I think, what we need. Be, be, because I, I, if, we, if we trust, if we want to start, uh, end on a very positive note, mm. uh, generally, uh, my outlook on people is most people want to do good. We have our good or bad days, yeah. but there are very few people I meet. Or have you met many evil people? No really evil people, you know? No, we don't, right? No. So if, if we all have that sentiment, it, it basically, if someone is going too much, you know, AI for greed, so it's evil. I mean, like even they are not evil, they're greedy, right? But if they take that too far, I think that will have a backlash, you know, yeah. like we, you know, and I, I think you can in some ways trust the society to in the end do a revolution, like the French revolution or whatever we do at some point in time, something will crack if yes. you are taking this too far. And it, nowadays it goes so much faster because yes. there is so much power uh, yes. through the social media platforms. So it's in a way ultimately self-regulating. Yes. This is my hypothesis. Hmm? What, do you, what do you think? I, think, I think if you take it too far, people say, fuck off to, to this guy or, or to this platform. I'm so eager to go to the you know regulation kind of side of things, but it's so boring topic. But I think it's actually a very important topic, but it's not very. Um, well, let's go there a little bit. Nah, what, what, no, you, but but state so. your angle. State your angle. I'm curious. What were you thinking about? <sighs> it will take like ten minutes to just you know <laughs> open up that kind of field. I think. Um, yeah, but it's a very important. But I think. Potentially, people are doing it a bit wrong these days and haven't really learned the lessons from GDPR. And just to say what we have said so many times before, GDPR, in some sense, wanted to you know, limit the power that tech giants had, but in the end, it turned out to be the opposite. And, and the people that, or the companies that truly had the ability to follow all the regulation and conform by that was the tech, was the tech giants. So in the, end, in the end, it actually accelerated the divide and once again, we can see the same things happening with the AI Act coming up now. And they are putting a lot of requirements on companies being conformative to you know, support high-risk AI. And, you know, of course, who will do that? Well, the tech giants have yeah, well, a problem. It's so simple, right? The tech giants with the, with the superior tech stack, mm -hmm. with the superior data in industrialized yeah. data control, and with the superior uh, lawyering department, they have no problem dealing with any of these regulations, no. but for the 
data illiterate, they don't even know where to start to, to untangle it. And for something that Google can do a couple of configurations and they've sorted it out. Yeah. And I truly believe it's that simple for them. But I think, uh, in my view, the, the GDPR is a, an example of where there has been really good intentions of why yes, we yes, wanted to do yes, it. Absolutely. I think it's That's so important. And same for the AI. Act. The intentions are intention great. Intention is good. And, and, and I think that um, if people follow those intentions and do the right thing with it, uh, regardless of GDPR, uh, uh, I think that is that has, uh, or more companies are doing that thanks to the GDPR. Uh, initiative. At least they're they're listening so the to the awareness to got up. The awareness got up, and people think about that, uh, even though they don't comply probably with all the different legal requirements. But the risk, I, I think, actually more people or companies, and I know a number of them in Sweden as well, that Parallel. chose to not continue to use data because they were so afraid about getting sued. In the so public sector, this is a real problem. I mean, yeah. like I, I think more than ever in yeah. Sweden. Uh, we are, they are, you know, with the Cloud Act, so everybody's going back on prem, yep. and it's screwing them up mm. big time for yep. no particular really. I mean, you know, there is not the useful security. I mean, like, I, it's just dumb. Yep. it's simply dumb, right? And with the daycare, when I leave my child, children, then I don't. <laughs> uh, you I, need I to have not your daycare. To need take to a have picture. Your own. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to have any photos of my kids on yeah, daycare. Well, I don't know, but but it's really? but it but it. And they are forced into it because they don't have the lawyering capacity or they, or actually the people who needs to tell them, there needs to be some level then in the public sector who basically says, well, point with the left arm, this is how we're going to do it. Yeah. It's it's left down to the co- stupid Värm du kommun, or it, it's left down to the dogis fröken to understand yeah. to how to interpret GDPR. That's totally insane, agree. man. Yeah, totally. It's completely insane. Completely insane. Cool. I want to end this on a still positive note. And it's so easy to get excited and angry when you speak about regulation. So I don't want to end But it's the, it's, the, it's the implementation and execution that is yes. screwed up. It's yeah. not the intention. Henrik, what do you think uh, of coming five years when it comes to the possibility to start a startup that uh, has an opportunity to, for one, face or you know, compete against uh, tech giants like Spotify did. I mean, they won against Apple and Google and Amazon and whatnot. Do you think that opportunity will grow in coming five years, or will it reduce? Uh, I think we can just look at data here uh, and uh, see how many startups are being created every year now. It's just completely on the rise, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what I also know uh, from data is that the conversion rate from startups going from the very early seed stage to the next phase and to the next phase is constant. Constant. Oh, it's constant. Yes. So, so it's, it's more growing. startups, but more the, and more startups, and we have seen from the years that the conversion rates between these rounds is stable. Similar. So is the, op- the the for- data tells us the data tells us that the future of tech-driven uh, companies uh, that will be big in Europe is very very positive. Yeah, and and then let me rephrase it. If we That's talk a positive note. Yeah, it's a really it positive note. It was a perfect note. ending, Henry. Okay, okay, continue. No, and, and, <laughs> I, 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 and would you argue the same for hyperscalers, like the real hyperscalers? Because I think, yes. Yeah. If you follow the data, they have gone the whole way and they become unicorns and all this. Yes. So I think uh, what is uh, uh, what could be a, a little a slight bump on this is uh, if uh, the IPO mar- or the um, stock markets start to crash now because we're in this small little bi- bubble we have. Mm. But uh, we all know from the past crashes that if that happens, it's going to be temporal and and, uh, the underlying growth is definitely there. And I mean, just thinking about the different uh, uh, foundations of why this is happening, they are not going to go away. I mean, the capital is there, all these tech tech platforms are there, there are lots of more people that knows how to build great companies. They know what good looks like. We didn't have this 10 years before. Now we have it, and we've seen this trajectory in Silicon Valley before. So, I mean, the future looks good for for startups. So all indicators are looking positive. We can see the number of startups is growing. We have the financing opportunities being improved with Hendrik and, and that yep. type of companies. And uh, there is no reason not to take the opportunity, right? If you have an idea, just go for it. But uh, I, I, it's, it's never been faster to build a, a global company than now. But what you did now is maybe the ending T-shirt. Uh, the world looks good uh, when I look at the data. Mm. <laughs> and it's never been faster to grow or build a growing the company. Data, uh, you know, this is t-shirts. Uh, data tells me time to grow. 
<laughs> awesome. <laughs> we done. Where can I buy this? Yeah, we, we're <laughs> we starting here. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Henrik, what's happening next in your life? Um, in, in private life, in personal life? Uh, I understand you, you will spend a lot of time with Arc Capital, I guess. But what's coming up in coming months? Um, well, that's uh, Arc. <laughs> yes. Right now, my life is arc. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and football but, training, but maybe. But I've never actually had so much fun in my life as now. Uh, but, but it's arc, and then it's a bit of uh, soccer coaching. Uh, soccer coaching, yes. Um, so uh, uh, you asked before about my hobbies, and mm -hmm. I think uh, after uh, time is spent on my baby arc, uh, it's uh, the rest of my life goes to my family. family. Having three kids and, and a dog, it's yeah, a lot of fun well. too. Yeah. So awesome. it's two startups, one two at start home up. and one uh, two startups. <laughs> I love here. I love a lot of uncertainties. I was going to ask you know if, if they can have some kind of analytics on the family side. Of it. Yeah, not, not let, no, let's not go there. <laughs> we go there after after <laughs> beer and, and ask him you know after. what 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 data points do you have at home? Uh, what indicators? <laughs> what indicate? <laughs> Henrik, who, who would you recommend to have on this podcast? Anyone that you would love to hear uh, us being? I was actually thinking about that, and I was thinking, what about yourselves? Oh, ooh. That was, yeah. How do you mean? That, I mean, you, you, have pretty, that. you have pretty interesting backgrounds and thoughts, mm -hmm. given all these uh, interviews and also yeah. your, your daytime work as well. That would be interesting. That was a Ooh, new, new That's a nice one. That, that was a very flirty of what you say, uh, smooching the, the, yeah, exactly. the host <laughs> <laughs> comment. And Buttering up. Buttering up. Yeah. I, but I loved no. it anyway. No, Great other than that, I think, um, uh, of course, Elon Musk, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, other than that, uh, I would also recommend people in my teams that I've been working with. So right. Really good yeah, yeah. superstars there. Yeah. In Arc Capital, I mean. Uh, and also the EQT. EQT. And EQT. You have, there are several superstars in, in and, and cool anyone, people. Anyone yeah. specific in EQT that you would recommend? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, one of a very dear colleague uh, who is extremely great at uh, all the AI parts is Lele. Have you met him? Lele. Lele Kau. You have to meet no. him. Oh, I don't. Okay, good. Thank you. That's some great advice. Yeah. With that, Henrik, um, it was a true pleasure to have you here. Likewise. We, I think we managed not even half of the qu or topics we prepared, <laughs> but that's you know, <laughs> the way it should be. And that's um, the way it should be. <laughs> and uh, we have still the, the after after work to, to do the proper forward. kind yeah. of uh, discussions. So but an awesome flow and an awesome energy, Henrik. Yeah. Thank for that. Thank you. Awesome. Likewise. Super fun. Thank you very much.